Oh, Michael's got that burial going. That's right. Giddy up. Cheers. 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 That's a big pour, Bumman. I'm not messing around. I'm not fucking around. It's 14.72. Oh, my God. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> we'll Someone was excited to have Alex on the show. I've got this yeah, but... weak Utah grocery store beer here. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Cheers, you guys Cheers. and gals. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, man. That's some good motor oil. What are you drinking there, Paul? Well, well, guys, I've got uh, Night of the Living Squatch. Uh, hmm. It's baby right here. It's a great notion. Um, it's 14.7%. This baby's barrel aged um, with cacao nibs, marshmallows, maple syrup, cinnamon, natural flavors, and caramel. Is that beer that was sealed with actual wax? Yeah, yep. because it was. You guys aged, are serious, so. man. This hey, you guys did do that. You guys so didn't that you see could, it. <clears throat> they do that so you can keep aging it if you want, like in a cellar or something. It's going to be like more airtight. It's kind of just like a tradition. I don't think it makes a huge difference, but hmm. you'll notice the bottle also isn't transparent. <clears throat> that way, no light can get through. It's like matte black. And no one noticed, but I bit that thing off. Just flex in there a little bit. Sometimes taking the wax off is so fucking hard. Oh, I've dude. I've cut myself so many times. Like with a knife, kind of carving yeah. that rim? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a challenge sometimes. I'm glad you got that beforehand. You took it off before you started recording. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd still be trying to get it off right now. Oh, I know. 20 minutes later. <laughs> Smashing it on your monitor. Jimmy, what are you, you drinking? Guys- so uh, I brought a, uh, a new beer that I um, got from my brother. So this is um, prison. Um, sorry. Here we go from Prison City Beer Works out in Your Auburn. Your brother sent you that from prison? Is that what you're going to say? Well, no, he got out. <laughs> but it's a... Um, it doesn't have great ratings when you look online, but uh, this is the second one I've had, and it's actually really pretty good. Um, so it's just it's a straight up single IPA uh, with um, what do they got a Citra and Centennial. Um, and it looks like it was canned two months ago, but uh, it's uh, really pretty solid stuff. I was surprised. I wasn't, good. Yeah, I wasn't expecting a whole lot, but good stuff. Can I mention one thing here real quick on right. these, on these big bottles with the big alcohol like this right here, people. Oh, boom. That right there. Is that a wine cork? Yep. Nice. That'll get <laughs> yeah, you at least a, that'll get you at least a couple more days on this baby. So you don't have to pound it all in the next three hours. So you guys, <laughs> you guys don't want to see that. You know, <laughs> yeah. 14, 14% beer. It's just funny. Cause winos will drink an entire bottle of wine that's 14 <laughs> yeah, like, percent <laughs> but it's it's just fun <laughs> if it's wine if it's beer you're an alcoholic all of a sudden. <laughs> true story <laughs> so i'm drinking locally tonight this is a new ipa that they've never done before from uh, tf brewing template family brewing here in salt lake it's called wavy boy hazy ipa this one has Strata, Superdelic, and Motueka hops, and it's 7%. And they just released this last week, so it's a really fresh can. And this is really good. Uh, lots of flavor, really nice hop flavor, no maltiness or anything. And even though it's like low ABV, they still loaded it with a good amount of hops, so it's pretty bold. Nice. Good deal. You'd probably like this one, Alex. Pretty smooth. I know you think you don't like IPAs, but he's got a I'm okay with ones. some IPAs. Like juicier tangier ones and not like quadruple hop like just trying yeah. to make it bitter and unpalatable <laughs> I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like that's the goal sometimes it just depends how they hop it like uh, yeah. at what stage of the brewing process they add the hops what part of the hop like of the cone of the hops that they add because like different uh pieces <clears throat> of each individual cone will have different profiles and stuff and 
Some parts will be more bitter and earthy and other parts more tropical. Tropical and fruity. Like so what fruity. are you drinking, Alex? What'd you bring? Uh, I have grocery store beer from Utah, but nice. it's a step up from the swill I used to drink in college. Oh, it's there we go. local. So there we go. I'm not far from Bryce. Um, and it's very drinkable. It's Kolsch and it's golden and goes down easy. And that one's called can, Hoodoo, right? From Uinta? Yeah, it's Hoodoo from Uinta Brewing Co., which is Salt Lake City, right? Yeah, they're in Salt Lake. Cool. Nice. Yeah, that's like that's it? all I know. I don't. I mean, hey, I like is it. That yeah, your it's very, uh, kind of. Yeah. Well, just you gave me all these recommendations, and it sounded like work to try to find it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big beer drinker. I don't like care to invest that much time experimenting but when other people give me a beer that i like then i remember that for later and have it forever wow sounds like maybe you weren't the best guest for this show after all oh i thought it was about views <laughs> we're all photographers <laughs> i'd be more enthusiastic about the brews but i don't know maybe i'm we sorry just get that part get straight to the i mean for alex it tastes good. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Could use it for leaves too. Droplets. <laughs> Got a nice yes. amber hue or golden. <laughs> hue. Yeah. yeah, it looks like some some fresh piss, man. A little foamy. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're it. slightly dehydrated. Using it in the same jar that you keep next to your bed at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only Sarah, when, thanks, uh, for... <laughs> Sarah, thanks for joining. <laughs> I was going to say it, there was people were talking about like when camping, uh, you know, like in the tent, like a piss bottle or whatever. Sorry, Sarah. And uh, <laughs> I just remember years ago, like Gary Randall posted like the industrial <laughs> like piss jug. It's just like a, a gallon. <laughs> like for truck drivers. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a, a gallon of milk like that, but just. I always thought that was so funny. Anyway, <laughs> go on. You, you got to like create like a hose system though. So you don't even have to get out of your sleeping bag. Like, you know, catheter built -in hose, man. Lady Jane. <laughs> Does it install the catheter. <laughs> <laughs> Let me slide this in real quick. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, uh -oh. Well, no. Sarah, thanks for coming back and filling in for Mike DiMiola who couldn't make it tonight. Yeah, I'm excited, I guess. <laughs> I'm happy to be back. <laughs> yeah, you enjoyed it so much. You were happy to get back in here. You wanted to get yeah. a piece of Alex. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I have some good Alex stories. So hopefully in the role is, is Phil and co-host that I can help in that role. Um, I chose a local beer again. So this is Telluride Brewing Company. Um, I don't know beer words and I don't know how to pronounce things. So like an Alpengose. And an Alpengose. Alpengoze, Alpengoze, mm -hmm. and then L E I P Z I G style, Le Leipzig Leipzig. style. So it's with made with local peaches, peaches from a canyon where we photograph. So nice little connection. I think I'd like it if it was a tiny bit sweeter, but otherwise, pretty good. Hopefully, you didn't pee on those peach trees at all when you were shooting them last time you were there. I wouldn't be really photographing, but more the canyon. The canyon is the draw, not the peach trees. <laughs> I just know you like the droplets on the leaves, so. <laughs> <laughs> hate that joke. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like the peach dry. It's, it's awesome. ruined the, the droplets on leaves concept for me forever, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I don't know who made that joke up, but. Disgusting, man. Yeah, some guy. They really I, did a disservice. Really mature account. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the droplets, though, I mean, unless you're really well hydrated, you'd have to like do individual white balance adjustments on them to get the clarity back. <laughs> for, like, so they're not make them clear and, again. Like... Yeah, so they're not yellow and like warm. You know, That's and then selecting the all the droplets would be a nightmare until AI is able to select droplets on its own. There we go. That'd that's when it really works. That's what we're waiting for. <laughs> that's the, that's <laughs> the big one. <laughs> Photoshop 26.0. Finally, <laughs> Bolino's here tonight for some reason. I don't know. You said something about like you weren't picking up his calls, Alex, and you owe yeah, him some money or something. Shit. He really wanted to be here. 
You invited me, man. We, we go way back. <laughs> I'm glad he's. Here. We go way back. I'm not sure what year, Alex, but it's I think it's the open. same year as Sarah, 2012. Yeah, Ron and I yeah. were talking about it this morning, yeah. and we met Alex in 2012. Yeah, I think it's around there. Eleven years. I think it was back in the like out right. in the Eastern Gorge Jeez. somewhere. It was Rowena. There yeah, was a whole so. gaggle of photographers out there. Yeah. I was just a trying gaggle? to meet people, and you like were like, the... you were clearly the nicest person. Like you actually wanted to talk to me. Yeah, so that was cool. <laughs> Is that like a proper biological term for a group of photographers? A gaggle yeah, like, of photographers, gaggle? like a murder of crows. Murder yeah. of crows. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> gaggle <laughs> uh beer uh this is from burial i have to thank paul for this guy um the problem with burial beers is their names are so long it seems like this one's called the mystifying endeavors for an unintelligible equilibrium and it's a double ipa and i believe made with uh galaxy strata and citra hops pretty solid I like it liking it yeah i do it's a little malty i think there's some I'm not sure there's malt in it, but maybe some oats it just seems a little bit kind of um on my end it looks kind of dark I like the beer is a little bit lighter in, in color in general mm. but it's pretty smooth i like it good mouth feel nice gotta is have that... that good mouth feel looks like coffee or something no, that's an idea. Okay, yeah, I see. It's a little yeah, more, more yellow. And yeah, it yeah. looked kind of <clears throat> brown, you know. Nice and thick. Light brown. So Alex fucking Noriega, man. What have you been up to? Uh, <laughs> just got back from Yosemite and just processed all the photos. So Yosemite shit. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, I looked at those on my phone. I didn't have a chance to look on my desktop yet, but some good, there's some bangers in there. Thank you. Oak burst. Yeah, people mentioned yeah, that one. That one was really nice. I always yeah make a mistake when I'm trying to like get people to see the new work. I lead with a photo that is not going to be popular, even when I know what the one that's going to be popular is. I feel like I just regret it afterwards i post it and i'm like well no one's going to see anything now because this isn't going to gain traction i should have used the crowd pleaser but i like oak burst too thank you yeah that one's sick all, all the rest are really nice too i was i, was I just replaced one was... probably since you last saw it uh yeah i liked it Made like 3 p.m but yeah uh that's all from the fall yeah i was doing Did the workshops with bill Neo and spring ones and then yeah now i'm caught up for the year Nice. Not holding back 120 photos for a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Not yet. You, that. <laughs> you have to be crazy for that. <laughs> a book that is never going to come out, apparently, because who knows what happened now. Delay? Oh, uh, yeah. No, yeah, it's been delayed uh, quite a bit. I've been like updating people, but you're, you probably don't read my newsletter. So. Can I cancel my pre-order? Uh, no. Once you're locked <laughs> in. <you're really> <laughs> Uh, that sucks i'm i'm excited to get it honestly it'll be soon i just uh i wanted to ensure the quality so there are a few things that they had to double check and then reprint a few pages and then double check stuff and yeah huh. just making sure it's as make sure it's right as it can be a book feels like forever you know it is kind of permanent in a way yeah like people will have copies when you're an old man and you'll be embarrassed about them if you if you don't like <laughs> something about yeah. it. So get it right. Yeah. Well, shit. Let's just get right into this then. Let's see what we got here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, the beard was thicker then. <laughs> What's going on here, Alex? Uh, <laughs> Tell us. Well, I think the photos speak for themselves. <laughs> I mean, I, I like Death Valley. What can I say? <laughs> Embracing it. Um, yeah, we'll call that an embrace. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shimmy. There's, there was a waterfall, right, that we had to get over, Sarah? Yeah. It's, like a dry fall, but it had yeah, water on it. It had water in it. it. Was actually... There was a series of... <laughs> so, yes, there was a... There was a, it's a backcountry canyon in Death Valley. We were there on Christmas Day. It was like you have to 
go around the waterfalls, <laughs> climb up some dry falls, go around more waterfalls. So yeah, Alex My, was enjoying this encounter with the rock. I just remembered that Sarah, you're such a Death Valley person that you described a waterfall in Death Valley as a dry fall with water on it. Like, <laughs> yeah. like that's just a waterfall. <laughs> Such a canyon nerd. I think this canyon, the particular canyon that we were in, I think that stream is, it's spring fed. And it's, it's an actual around. waterfall. Yeah. yeah. So it was flowing reasonably, like it was for Death Valley. It was a fairly gushing waterfall. Nice. Well, that's that's a fun photo. I forgot about that. <laughs> How flat my backpack is. It doesn't look like anything's in there. I was just I was noticing that. <laughs> so how, how come you sent me the two frames, Sarah? The first one, he's like kind of hesitant, like checking it out. And the second one, he's like gratified. Or... Pensive. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, they, that both of them were necessary to, to capture the experience. I thought you'd choose one of them, not it's necessarily a, put them together. It's a diptych. If it's you, like, if, yeah. <laughs> if you uh, like put them in a timeline and like copy and paste it and copy and paste it, it'd be a really good gift. Like, back oh yeah, forth, you know. <laughs> then it would do, get the motion. Some, yeah. There were some others in the series that I didn't feel were as appropriate for this. I feel like so. Sarah, you will have been more forgiving in terms, <laughs> or like less ruthless in what you provide Eric yes, with than Ron was, was about you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. really easy on you. <laughs> yeah. I went easy on Alex. I did not <laughs> did not go deep into the iPhone archives. You're probably the person with the most dirt on me. The most <laughs> Look at this. Yeah, like... <laughs> action shot. <laughs> Whoa. It's a pretty impressive photograph. That's pretty it amazing. Is, yeah. Oh, it's cool. <laughs> So you're like, uh, are you like showing off with some skills with this or measuring something or? That's the Fat Max and I've got it right here. Oh, nice. And what it is, <laughs> is this is a measuring tape with 13 feet of standout. And if you don't know what standout is. Where it locks. Yeah. It, no, this is how far out you can get it before it falls. Yeah. 13 foot hmm. erection. Yeah. I mean, look at this. Yeah. I, that's solid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this started because Sarah and and Ron and I, maybe some other people, I don't remember how many people were there, but we were in the trailer. And they didn't believe you? Death Valley. No, we were in Sarah's trailer, uh, Sarah and Ron's trailer, and this was before Death Valley even had decent cell service or Starlink or anything. So we were there for like a month with no internet and we find ways to entertain ourselves <laughs> and they had a tape measure and I just started like trying to get it up on their cabinet. And <laughs> then we like realized we needed a stronger one because it was a little weakling and looked it up and found out that standout is like a thing for contractors because they want to be able to reach across like rafters and shit. And yeah, I've got this all the way across the room. Let's see. So the goal where the photo is taken is to go straight up and see how high you can get it. And I think that Nolan Nitschke is the person I've seen with the highest ever at like 21 feet or something. Dang. But I've got this at 12 feet, two inches right now. I think Still not you, like always, to... you always research stuff before you buy it, like camera gear and stuff. Like you, you really research stuff. Like I always just ask you like what you think about certain things. So did you like research that and then go out and buy it just because it had that? Yeah, I mean, you I looked in the Home Depot Death website <laughs> and I had it shipped to Death Valley and then we started. <laughs> uh, did you send any of the time lapses? I did not, no. Um, yeah, so we started having these competitions to see how high, because when you're going straight up, you get even more than 13 feet. But then if a gust of wind comes or it starts fluttering, then it falls and that's what happened in the photo and it was perfect timing. And we're so doing this in a, in a public campground with people yeah. staring and wondering what are these weirdos doing for like three hours well, with a tape measure. <laughs> the funny thing is from most of the campground's perspective, we were like behind the RV. If they were watching your RV, they would just see occasionally this yellow tape just rise up behind the RV and then fall. And then like a bunch of laughter like from six people and then like giggling from grown adults and then it would yeah. go back up again. <laughs> That's so good. So did anyone spend my time yeah 
Did anyone <laughs> exceed the 13 feet is the question. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, when you're going straight up, you can beat 13 feet. That's a horizontal measurement. Oh, nice. Stand out. So Nolan Nitschke did it um, once in Death Valley, just me and him. I was telling him about it, and he just tried it. And his first or second try, he beat all of our records. It was crazy. <laughs> like over 20 <laughs> feet. <laughs> it's so a 25-foot tape measure. You need Fat to pack the Fat Max. For, yeah, for I can't forget it. Yeah. It's impressive. No one's going to be getting the DMs after this episode goes live. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can really go. Does it really extend more there. than 13 feet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. That's cool that's just digging through Google. Wow. Google PBRs. search. Yeah, I just searched Google. like badass bros drinking beers in the mountains. You found this on Google. We came up. <laughs> no, I sent it no, to him. Sent it, yeah, but I didn't know if you searched for our names and that was somewhere <laughs> online. I don't know. <laughs> so I want to find it. I want to find the memories. Yeah. So I think we were, where were we? Like in the gorge, I think. I think we were coming out of um, Mazzi Grotto. Do you remember this thing? Yeah. Best in Mazzi Grotto you. was that day. Yeah, I think it was me, you, and TJ. And we just came out and you had driven us up this called crazy. Dire Falls. Dire Falls? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not Dire Falls. No, Adamus shot that. Adamus. First. Yeah, in like What's, 2008 or something. Isn't there another one that people, people were calling like Dire Falls Dire for Falls. a long time? Fairy yeah. Falls, maybe? Mossy Grotto. Or uh, Emerald Falls. Emerald Mossy. On Gorton Creek. I don't know the Greenest actual place in the gorge. The crazy thing with the story is like I've always hiked up and then back down into Mossy Grotto, then reverse trail. And Alex is like, I got the secret back away. I can take my Subaru up. And he was taking us up these crazy kind of like power lining roads. Like, and I did not think his car was going to get up there. And he just kind of powered through and got us up. And I think we're right about the spot where the, where the, we can park your car. And this is after going in and coming back out. And, uh, it was just fun. It's a good day. And I think Alex, was that the night we all met up with people from that one group online down in uh, yeah. SD Locks. Same yeah, night. Yeah, Facebook group and yeah, uh, with like with 50 photographers group. in it and a lot of them were able to make it to this meetup. Yeah, yeah it was pretty gorge. fun. That was fun. Photographers. What's that? 51 photographers. 51, yeah. yeah area of 51. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The old days. The old Most days. 2014, the photo the was taken. Days. Yeah. This is like the height of like 500 px and stuff like that the whole just like just disgustiness of that era of photography in some ways yeah i mean well the fact that we were all lined up at masi grotto to but well, actually you got a nice unique shot that day well here's the deal so we were hiking back out the very bottom of that kind of like you know scree moss covered rocky section and we were stopped kind of like just me you and tj talking and i showed you that image and you went back down to go photograph it. I was like, do not fucking get that shot because you're gonna kill it. More than me. So it. I guess either you didn't find it or you didn't really see it or you just didn't execute in a way you liked, but I was really glad you did not photograph that. I was like well, thinking he's gonna- I can't imagine that I would even do that. I, I feel like maybe I saw like potential for something else Different. in the scene. Not that like, you're gonna I can't imagine exact... that I would go try to do it, yeah. like stomp it. No, no, right I didn't imply that. Now. How long ago was this? No, no, no. I'm just saying, but maybe it was nine years this ago. This looks maybe. older. 2014. Yeah. I know okay. gray. I was actually didn't have the dad bod yet. I mean, <laughs> I was already like rocking a, the dad. Good old bod. days. <laughs> you know, without kids. Looks like a youngster there. <laughs> I probably, the yeah. beer. Other than the gray, that's why Bellino shared this photo. He likes how he looks in it. He wanted to show himself <laughs> off. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yes. So true. It's like flexing. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, the, what uh, kind of what kind of vehicle do you have now? Because I know you got rid of your trailer. I still have the massive F three fifty. I hate it. Why haven't you switched it out? I'm surprised. You switched. It's your, just a pain out, to like... sell a vehicle. You can't just sell it on Fred Miranda. You know. Yeah. Because every time <laughs> I see you, you have a different, an entirely different camera setup. I'm back to the one that I've been on the most for the last or many years, but um. Yeah, I hate selling cars. R5, Canon. Okay. 
I love that one. I it was just a an affair I had with Fuji and Nikon, <laughs> but I'm I'm back in my Canon marriage. We've had counseling and we're fine. <laughs> um, what was the question? Oh yeah, I have a giant truck that I hate. It's way too big. I want a Tacoma. At the time, I had a Subaru. Um, yeah, I need a good adventure vehicle. That F three fifty like has a really stiff suspension. So whenever you go on like washboard or off-road, it's just like just jerking you everywhere. And it's, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. The Tacoma is smooth. Yeah. It's got soft suspension. Oh yeah. You have one now. Yeah. I got blasting down dirt roads. Yeah. I used yes. to blast. I can't blast anymore. Yeah. Remember when we were uh, driving to that viewpoint and Owl Creek. Anza, Anza Borrego trying oh. to make it before the pink light. I feel like I was blasting then, like just. Was I in your car? It. I thought I was. No, you were in a different being car, with but Dave and Jennifer, yeah. But I feel like we had a convoy going there, racing each other. It was ridiculous, like <laughs> that I would drive that way on an off road. <laughs> Gotta chase the light, man. <laughs> it's important. It's the most important thing. Getting the photo, safety, second, third, fourth. <laughs> yeah. I had Those Taylor in the car soft, with me though. on our first date, basically. <laughs> yeah you guys were just barely dating that trip <laughs> mike was there on that trip too yeah, I think oh, yeah I was you were there. Yeah. yeah yeah new year's eve <laughs> yeah there were a lot of people fun, there fun time we should start doing that again <laughs> <That'd be fun. laughs> yes what is going on here <laughs> i had okay before we get into this i still carry my tripod that way the one on the right uh -huh. and I had a 21 year old client on my Yosemite workshop and he said unironically that that was really cool the way that I was carrying the tripod. <laughs> and I thought that's, that's neat. What's the benefit yeah. to that? <laughs> oh, just, uh, you don't have to hold it with your arms. It just like rests on your shoulder. And it's not awkward. Does it make you like hunch or it's not uncomfortable? No, it actually kind of hurts as the camera like weighs down, but it's not as bad as like over one shoulder with the tripod closed. And then you don't have to open up the tripod again. So you're saving putting time. Putting it in your backpack is the worst. Once you're ready it comes for business. out, it never goes back in. <laughs> is that Sarah? Is that your tripod in the background there pointed at the ground? Probably. The <laughs> Ron's tripod's in down. the mix. Your tripod's in the mix. Mine's in the mix. It's like the precursor of your events with TJ. Jeans, like it too. I was still outside. wearing jeans in nature. But no Jansport backpack. No, I had upgraded to an F stop. Looks like. <laughs> yeah, just must another, be riveting. Yeah, <laughs> another day <laughs> of of entertainment out out on the salt flats of Death Valley. <laughs> yeah, the crappy shoes that you have to have because they will get destroyed by by the base. Looks like your knees your uh, your knees got messed up too. It's probably looking for macro. Crawling around in the salt and crud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Digging for compositions. <laughs> Creating with your hands. Nice. <laughs> Manicuring them. Mm. What's going on here? Have you, you Just, sent that's a great had your center column removed, right? Yeah. I had a columnectomy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now uh, my tripod is inert and it won't be making more tripods. <laughs> sterilized i have an flm without a column now i always like to shoot up high to get over obstructions mm -hmm. and like you know get better depth of field pointing down on stuff and yeah especially i just hated trees, being like, so i hated walking around sky. fully erect you know it's not <laughs> <laughs> it's no way to be yeah and if it's up for too long it's hard to get it back down again it gets like comfortable oh, yeah in position, if you keep your center sticky. column up for more than four hours you need to seek attention <laughs> You need to call your tripod manufacturer. <laughs> uh, camera repair specialist. Alex, what do you call a photo taken with a fully erect center column? Is this a riddle? Or you... uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do have a... I don't know that I should get into it. <laughs> I think is this, is The thing with TJ, is that what you're talking about? No. <laughs> no, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I don't think What's the thing do. with TJ? I don't know. I don't nothing. <laughs> next next subject. subject. Nothing. Yes. 
<laughs> no, it's a joke. What do you call a photo okay. taken with a fully erect what silicone? Do you, what do you call it? Indecent exposure. Nice. Um, <laughs> oh. Uh, wow. Oh. I don't know that. Yeah, the thing with TJ, you got to ask sometime, but I really don't think it should be on the internet. Like, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have him on the show and we'll grill him about it. We'll get it. Maybe out he'll do it. Maybe he'll talk about it. I don't know. Okay. I don't have no idea what it could be. It's up that alley. Ooh. Remember that day? Yes. Colorado, some, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Got some blue steel us. going on here. <laughs> yeah look at that Dude. holy shit <laughs> who's that guy on the left i don't recognize him matt Payne. some unknown photographer some new guy <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't look like that anymore he's so thin now from his colorado trail hike yeah he's kind of got a beer belly here i still think he looks pretty good in this photo because i'm next to him like there's just comparatively context yeah the power of context <laughs> i thought the facial expression was notable along with another center column yeah fully Ooh. erect i i mm -hmm. was enjoying what i was shooting though that was a reflected aspen shot that's in your favorites gallery isn't it it is <laughs> it is a favorite well, that's not the okay wait alex i think i know what you're talking about now i won't say it but uh <laughs> It has something to do with like you can't take a photograph unless you really like <laughs> unless you really like the scene. So you can't like Okay. Here's what I'll say. It. It's <laughs> it's a hypothetical device wherein you would only be able to take a photo if you really liked the scene. Just try to imagine that. However you will. <laughs> <laughs> a shutter remote. <laughs> I device. forgot about this joke. Oh my God. <laughs> Similar to a uh, flashlight. <laughs> well, now you just now it's out there. So the buttons at the back of it, and so you really have to be into what you're shooting. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. I'm so sorry. I didn't. Yeah. I wasn't she came gonna... for. Are you kidding me? I've I've been in the presence of this joke before. So. <laughs> I knew what she was getting into. <laughs> so the yeah. The buttons at the back and, and then we figure that it's kind of like at best you can get like a continuous low speed like two or three frames a second <laughs> if you need to shoot water exposures <laughs> oh my god that's, that's that now it's out there for the world to you know make a prototype and steal our idea <laughs> yeah we could be missing out this is proof that it was me and tj it was said here yeah, first. File a patent. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got documented proof. <laughs> like, oh, I was being coy about it, and there it just comes right out. <laughs> oh, Bellino. Yeah, that was, a good, that was a great trip. It was. It was type, here. type two fun. Type two, <laughs> yeah. But, but it's so funny. Like, you had, um, you said there's a great weather window for one system was clearing. Perfect conditions, another system approaching, and we nailed it. It was perfect. Yeah, that sunrise was awesome. Yeah, and the sunset. It, and just look at the trees in the background. Like, it was a, oh, a hot, windy snowfall. February, so there's about, what, 20 feet or 30 feet of snow on the ground? Yeah, I think it was actually, I wrote it in the description of the photo, 18 feet or something crazy. Like 18 that. feet. Like, yeah. like the, the meadows around... Uh, at Mazama Ridge that we had photographed in like August with wildflowers like there are tall trees there and there were just the tips of trees sticking out of the snow yeah um, it was perfectly. so crazy to see like you're up above this meadow yeah that's crazy. such a good trip also no wind we were backpacking mm. and so I imagine that trip with a lot of wind and that would have been absolutely brutal I think but there just... was in the morning was there maybe there yeah, was yeah I remember like bad, being though. worried about frostbite legitimately yeah. because yeah. i had sweat so much in all my clothes and my gloves and stuff that they just froze overnight oh is that right and yeah. in the morning wearing that stuff in the wind like i could just feel everything Ooh, freezing mm. yeah yeah no it was a great trip it was like one of those perfect trips where everything pretty much worked out condition wise photography wise just fun you know such a good trip did you cut that trouble you know we did not 
This is a. Uh, this probably gets a lot of traffic later on the, in the day, during the winter time. Um, but a uh, very productive day. I know I got a couple on this day, a couple keepers. I know Alex got a couple keepers, which he did very well with as well. So, um, yeah, anyway, well, the one, day. the one foot, like the, the whole thing we the were trees. doing for was like the epic sunrise on Rainier and like I have the shots, but it was the shot on the way, like near the parking lot. Yeah. That was the best award winner and my favorite and like not what I expected at all. And like, yeah, I just, and at the time I didn't even know what I had. I was like, Oh, well that's okay. But let's get that pink sunrise. And then I know exactly. And then like, and that's like what, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. So pretty close, pretty late in the morning. The light was kind of flattish and it just was, it just worked out perfectly. It was like yes. a diffused spotlight that came through. Yeah. Oh my God. And a it little so bit of light. Wide. So yeah. put some shadows on those trees, which is for your image is what distinguishes it from mine. I feel like is that it, the little shadows on the trees just made it just sing. It was such a great needed element. And I think the main difference between ours is the spacing and that's, we were standing next to each other on the trail and it's probably like I was blocking you from going where I wanted to go. And like, <laughs> I, maybe, maybe. Somebody online accused me of copying you. I was, like, I was like, dude, I can't copy a guy sitting next to me. Like, we're not going to compare LCD images. Like, in yeah, or like, and it's pretty, yeah, like, you're shooting one thing, right? So it's, yeah, like it's an image like we that. both it's recognized like, it immediately. Yeah, we, we but both But it's not like you could, like, see it and then go back, like, the next yeah. year. And it was ridiculous. It or even know where it was taken, like. Yeah, well, and I've been back another year. Like, two years later, I came back, and the snow was yeah. not like that. And it was, like, it was really snowy, but that wasn't happening anymore. Yeah. It was just like a really fortunate moment to be there. It's perfect. Great trip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like the one time I did winter backpacking and now I know that I don't like winter backpacking. It's like, it's not pleasant <laughs> at all. Just like my, my heater stopped working or my, uh, my jet boil didn't work. So I had to borrow your, your cooking yeah. setup. And anyway, and just like melting water in the stove is a pain in the ass. So winter backpacking is a totally different experience than summer. All of spring. Yeah, you were gonna come winter backpacking with us, Alex, when you uh, got the permits for us to go to the enchantments, and then you bailed, and we all went. Yeah, great time. You missed I out, had, buddy. I know. No, I've seen the photos and heard the stories. It sounds so good. I so good. thought that I had a serious dental issue, but it was. You panicked. Yeah, I mean, I thought I would have to get a root canal or something. It was really bad, mm -hmm. like the the pain. But then it just went away. And <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> flared up right before our winter backpacking trip and then went away as soon as I didn't over. think it was going to be winter I thought it'd be fall I don't think you knew that snow was coming no we did because uh like three days before we were checking the conditions and it was showing like single digits at night and stuff and that it had been dumping snow nonstop. stop yeah it was we were still whole... brave enough yeah it snowed the Some whole way up Asgard Pass you know the whole big climb is just dumping on us yeah sounds sketchy brutal. it didn't feel Super too bad icy. It looks steeper than it is, right? I mean, it's like 2,000 feet and a half a mile or something? Yeah. I think it's so. like is it switchbacky or is it like stairs? Yeah. Like straight it's up? Kind of both. There's like a little trail you can follow in the summertime. Um, there wasn't too much snow. We just followed the trail up. It wasn't too bad. I didn't have micro spikes. So coming down like three days later was definitely sketchy for me. Much more sketchy than, you know, that's back how, up. Yeah, after all the snow and ice and stuff. Yeah. But it's great. So this looks like when I met Sarah. Yeah. Just, I didn't know there was a photo of this. That's Miles Morgan on the left. I didn't know there was left. either. Yeah, Miles and Ryan. Mike was there. Jeremy David Cram. Thompson. David Thompson. Alex Moody was somewhere. Brian Swan was somewhere. Jeremy Cram's in the background. I think that's yeah. Ryan. If Miles is there, I'm pretty sure it's Ryan in the red hat sitting down. Yeah, with the shorts. That's Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there were so many people there all like it wasn't coordinated yeah it wasn't no. coordinated <clears throat> yeah we met all, all sorts of people that morning that we're still friends with just that random morning on the trail and i took one of my favorite photos in my entire portfolio that morning is it the clearing the like foggy just foggy trees. oh the in the meadow mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The below. Okay, I love that photo. Yeah. yeah yeah and i've been there several times in fog since i've never seen conditions that perfect like i didn't under understand what we were experiencing at the moment um, with the combination of super dense fog and the, the flowers were so um 
that's a pretty good flower year as well and amazing but yeah like amazing. there were even those little yellow lupin looking things like mixed in it was like a really good medley and everything yeah, was, was popping at the same medley. time do you feel like uh for the last five years like wildflowers just haven't been how they used to be like anywhere oh because of the heat yeah i don't know yeah. i just i just feel yeah. like in the last like five years like or they so, get like, cooked faster or don't yeah or they just haven't crazy. sprouted up at all and sarah probably knows the lupin here in Colorado this year were amazing. We had a really good wildflower year here. And then wildflowers in the California desert were really good this year. But I would agree that like late summer mountain wildflowers have kind of seemed, at least the places that we go have seemed kind of off. It just seemed like they used to be amazing like every year until like 2018, 2019 maybe. And then now it's like super hit or miss or none at all in some places. You used to be able to count on it. I like how in older photos, I'm always wearing jeans. There's a thing, a <laughs> uh, story about the Narrows, too. Like, I wore them in the Narrows the first time I did that hike. <laughs> 2014 with Joe Ross back. I did, no, I just didn't know anything. Like, I, <laughs> I have the Jan Sport in this photo. You can see the orange. How'd you meet oh, Joe that... Ross back back then? That's my, uh, I knew him through Alex Modi, who I knew, I don't remember how. I met him, but that's how I knew Joe. You were just a social butterfly, huh? Hanging I was. I was like inserting myself into the scene, trying to like meet people and assert dominance. I no. think it's important <laughs> to talk about though, like the scene back then was so so different. It was yeah. much much smaller. Yeah, yeah like tighter. you could post on Flickr and like you'd know all the other landscape photographers in the Northwest, and like everyone knew each other and like actually talked to each other. I guess. Yeah, it was much more tight knit. Well, like they talk to each other online in the photo community, like on the photo sites and not like by text privately like we do now. Yeah. You know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, but it's so big now. It is kind of hard to like have a cohesive discussion with anyone. Yeah. Publicly, you know, there are certain places, but it's not like before. But yeah, I just wanted to shoot nature and I looked up to all these guys and I wanted to meet them and yeah just started like showing up at the hot spots and <laughs> other people would be there because at that time like talking about Joe like Joe and Ian Plant were on the younger side but they had still been photographing for years so they were among the more established people yeah. At that point, when the rest of us, like Alex and Mike and I, like we would have just been start like a couple of years, like more serious into nature yeah. photography of, around then. So Joe and Ian were like the the established people who had been publishing books and doing all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I remember Joe, <clears throat> Ian like took Alex Modi under his wing, sort of, or Joe did. I guess Alex was really young, and then I was like, I always felt like the young one. Like everywhere I went because I was I think I was like 20 oh, how old am I now I was like 26 <laughs> here or something and wow uh, 25 <clears throat> that's and... how I was for a while <laughs> what 25 I was like no no I'm just saying like I was the youngest guy and then now like yeah. younger guys that yeah well I feel very acutely aware of not being the youngest person anymore which you know, you just feel like that's how it's going to be forever. But then I have like a 21 year old in my workshop and like I make references and he doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about. He's a really cool guy, by the way, if, if you watch this. My uh, daily existence. Know, but, yeah, like just fewer and fewer people understand what the hell you're talking about. Basically. And, <laughs> oh, and you feel, I guess I feel like I wish nothing would change just in general like get off my lawn like i hate ai and all this stuff like <laughs> yeah exactly. but you need to have this to be able to say those things okay no on, on, uh, think? on wednesday the uh spotify release they're unwrapped so you could see who like who you listen to what your top songs were and all that i've never seen a high school derail so fast <laughs> That's <laughs> what that's what transpired. And they were like, What'd you get? What'd you and I was like, uh, all right, I'll, I'll look. And then 
ended up being Led Zeppelin, like by far, you know, and they're like, <laughs> they're like, who's that? Who, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, haven't you seen Wayne's world? And they're like, what? <laughs> like, you know, SNL. And they're like, what? And like Mike Myers, Austin Powers. And they're like, I was born in 1999. <laughs> like, I know. I just, yeah, I, Not even. Class over. Like I'm going to sit here and cry into my more. hands. <laughs> I looked at my Spotify rap the other night, and it was all shit that I don't even listen to because I share my account with my family. Oh, that's a oh, shame. Wow. I like personal statistics. I would never do that. <laughs> what was I your? Like, did you look at yours, Alex? Yeah. Noah K. Well, yeah, number, one. number one. And Taylor no, okay. Swift. You've been listening number... to... Uh, Stick season, yeah. Stick season's so good. That whole album, oh my god, it's nice. Yeah, it's been it's on repeat, catchy. man. Same. And and Good his season. other albums are good too. I'm not as big of a fan because they're more poppy, you know, like more produced and like I like the acoustic feel of this one and how it was very like emotional. They weren't all like and... that. I've only like gotten single songs from the other ones and it sounded like they were mm. good. But maybe I just found the ones I liked. I couldn't um, find other stuff that I resonated with as much as that album. Maybe that's why he blew up when he did then. Yeah, we were looking at tickets, and it's like three hundred dollars or something. It's like, I'm sorry, I can't afford, or like two fifty. So I can't afford five hundred dollars for us to see, like someone I didn't even know about a year ago. Like I thought about taking us to James Taylor in Las Vegas. Now that we're close, like my dad used to listen to James Taylor, and I've been listening to him my whole life. Mm -hmm. And it would have been like six hundred dollars plus hotels. Wow. It's like, but that might be worth it because it's fucking James Taylor. I might die soon I'm like yeah it depends on the venue though i feel like i feel like when he came to salt lake years ago it wasn't nearly that much i know everything has gone up in price in the last few years but yeah, even like uh john mayer like a couple years ago i got my wife a ticket and it was like 70 bucks i think oh that's crazy because he's yeah and john mayer's a big one insanely huge. Yeah. i saw him a lot back in the day <clears throat> i've been a fan since college uh and it was very affordable then. I know because I was able to do it as like a college student. <laughs> I saw him when he was in the trio, the the blues trio in a small venue. And I was like near the front and I didn't understand what the hell I had. Like that's <laughs> like if you saw Eric Clapton in a small venue when he was like in the 90s or 80s or something. 80s yeah. probably, you know. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, this is. I'm always going to be able to see John Mayer. This is no big deal. <laughs> now it's like stadiums, and it's a million dollars. I think the last concert I went to was Black Sabbath when Ozzy Osbourne toured with them again for a year or two. That's pretty that was amazing. Time. Nice. Yeah. Shed a tear. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask if this is? Uh, have I done okay on the? The banter i don't really know if i've derailed it too much the derailing is the show that's <laughs> okay yeah the derailing right. is it <laughs> it starts like, off I didn't, derailed i didn't watch this to hear about james taylor and tape measures yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good <laughs> there's gonna be thousands of people in their garages like doing that I should get an yeah. affiliate link for the Fat Max. <laughs> Why they call it the to... Fat Max? Because it's really wide. It's wide, yeah. It has a lot of girth. Wide boy, yeah. Very girthy. What? Actually, mine is uh, like the the tip, you know, isn't straight on mine, and so it kind of flutters in the wind now because it's taken so many falls that now it's like a little less stable. It's always trying to trying to fall so i might need a new one at some point if i'm going to get back into replacement um, competitive standout <laughs> competition they should make another one the game. they should make another one that's even like bigger called the thick max like t-h-i-c-c -C. <laughs> xl <laughs> xl i mean let me just be cheating though it's like it's yeah there's so there's much that stability line. you know yeah it's not even a, a handheld tape measure anymore i'm sure that charlotte if she watches this will love that this discussion is happening over her photo by the way <laughs> so um i don't know if charlotte has been featured on the show before jimmy or paul might remember um but i've been a fan of her work forever so it was just a matter of time so i'm glad you chose an image from her to finally get her on here. What made you want to select this one? What is it that you like about this one so much? 
Well, let me start by saying that I was a little hesitant because I know that Michael Fry also has, I think he was with her and has this photo too. So it's not like the the thing that Charlotte has that nobody else has that says the most about her vision. Because another thing is she is really, like has a really unique eye for color. And uh, I feel like I'm, you know, not demonstrating what's unique about most of her work with it, but it just does so much for me. It's so, I mean, Whim and, yeah, whimsical, but like dramatic at the same time and imaginative. And like, I just love that it's not reliant on anything you would expect. Like it's not a photo you'd ever expect to get, but um, like leaning into the thing that most people would see as bad conditions too, like the wind with trees. The wind and yeah. I mean, TJ has a shot like that too that I really like. And um, I just, I love the chaos of it too. And that, I mean, the composition really works, but I'm always really uh, impressed when people are able to leave things more chaotic because I feel like I have such an analytical mind that I try to perfect everything. And I don't know that I would have such a natural looking interpretation of it. You know, like it, I just love everything about it. I feel like it just comes down to being willing to experiment and just like play into whatever conditions you find. So what I would imagine is like she was shooting and she was like, oh, it's windy, stuff is blowing around. I'm blasting my ISO and, and boosting my shutter speed and I still can't get it sharp. What if I just go the other way and see what it looks like with it blurry? And then, you know, you take a few exposures and you see one, it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then you try to refine it and, you know, you, you start to get some intention with what kind of a scene you, you want to get out of it maybe. And maybe that's what happened here. Like, I'm sure it wasn't something that she preconceived before she got here or when she left in the morning to go shoot that day. Yeah. I mean, that's my favorite. Most of my favorite photos are not anything I expected or had in mind. And I just feel like this is the exact kind of thing that I would be so excited to find and never expect. Yeah, it's super nice. And it's a, like the, to try this 10,000 times, like most of them are not going to work. But then to have one actually work where the wind motion, like if the wind motion is in the right places and there's enough of the, I think, dogwoods that are still sharp that you can, you still have a sense of what you're looking at. But then you also have that whimsy and the feeling of movement and all the other things that make it dreamy and magical. Mm -hmm. And it's even distribution throughout the scene, which really yeah. levels it out, which mm -hmm. really makes it very appealing to the eye. This is beautiful. Yeah, it's nice that there's some stuff that isn't blurry so that it has some good structure still to yeah. to be like the backbone of the blurry stuff, you know, to hold it all together and not just make it look random or haphazard. Yeah, those trees in the background definitely play a very important role in the scene. Although much, very much a secondary role, but without those trees in the background, it'd be it have a much different feel in that regard. And the spacing is really nice from left to right. The main dogwood has nice structure too. I'm glad it wasn't moving so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the actual yeah. trunk of it. Right. Um, yeah, like you were saying though, Alex, the hard part about choosing photos for the show is like, in a way you want to choose a photo that kind of represents the photographer's work in like a single photo, but that's just impossible to do, you know? So it's like, you just got to yeah. go off. Like you just like the photo and, and you can't. Yeah. And I, I tried to choose, well, I mean, I know I chose some well, well-known people, but also people that I still think are underappreciated, even though Charlotte is very accomplished. I still think not enough people are talking about how incredibly good she is. Like I, just always love her work. And this one speaks to me more than almost any other, even if it's not perfectly representative of her, her overall vision. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I remember this one. I remember when I saw it, I was blown away the first time. The, um, the blossoms also kind of like, to me, take on like the, um, the image of like doves. Yeah, they look like birds and the movement. Yeah, butterflies. Once you start that, keying in on that, it's like that works so well. Like Damn. Breathing. Good point. 
Charles Kramer. Kramer. Good choice. Yeah, I never heard of this guy, man. <laughs> Is he like and a the new thing, guy or something? Is he new on the scene? Or <laughs> but I honestly think a lot of people watching probably don't know who Charles Kramer is because he's Sadly, not big yes. in social media. Right. He don't, he only has one book out and it's kind of small. I honestly think he's one of the best photographers ever. Like if you look at his body of work and his compositions are so brilliant. Like this one I just love for the the elegance and simplicity and i've shot this grove of trees and it's really difficult without the fog but i think even with it i never would have quite laid it out the way that he does oh my god i love his work it's so good yeah i totally agree he's probably the reason that i photograph intimate landscapes now is seeing his work for the first time so i'm i'm thrilled that you included check, one of his photos check the date on that too i yeah, know too. 1982 yep. 82 wow so yep. to achieve such perfection on film too you know like it's just like a complete awesome. mastery of the craft and to think of all the crutches we have these days and i still probably couldn't come anywhere close you know it's I mean, good photography is always going to come down to those two elements, light and mm -hmm. composition, no matter what equipment you're using. So that's why, mm -hmm. like, even as far back as Elliot Porter, like they have images that could be posted today and people would freak out and be blown away because they had such a great understanding of light and composition and the gear and the restrictions they had were pretty much irrelevant for the most part. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think relevant in a way in that, um, and I would talk about this in our photo critiques that they were composing upside down on the ground glass on medium and large formats. So they only saw the forms and they weren't seeing the literal image right side up. So I think that actually helps with composition, like just thinking about balance and form more so yeah. than like, oh, this is a grove of trees. So it looks right to me already. Mm -hmm. You know, I often flip my stuff upside down when I'm processing to see what mm -hmm. I'm missing. Something about this particular photo that I think like the, leaving the line of snow in the foreground instead of like the temptation if i were standing in front of the scene i think my temptation would be to cut out the ground entirely yeah. but then the snow and then the bit of the ground that doesn't have the snow like it all adds visual layering and complexity and context and so i think seeing a photo like this reminds me that like i need to sometimes zoom out a little bit and including Me more too. context isn't always a problem i may have lost the ground entirely like that might be my inclination in fact i just posted a photo of this area with beams coming through oaks with no ground because i couldn't make the ground work and part of it is that they have like these cages growing plants there now like mm -hmm. protective cages so you can't really use the ground but mm. yeah like charles reminds me that there's beauty in like all parts of the scene he uses everything and it's often things that i would try to exclude in my quest for simplicity and i just yeah that's that snow like links you to the white up above and it just makes it feel so much more cohesive than if it was a brown <clears throat> strip at the bottom yeah definitely and even um you know here we are in 2023 and we look at this image and we were all you know just blown away by it and i can speak for myself that five seven eight years ago if i saw this online i'd probably scroll right past it and i feel like this <laughs> is a nice return to the aesthetic of the old masters that you know, our generation even the newer generation are starting to really dive into and i think it's been a really positive development for landscape and nature photography in general that's for sure I feel like that's something to aspire to because they had to be such masters of composition and light. They didn't have like, I don't know, the wow of like a crazy ass focus stack or, uh, you know, You're ultra wide angle, like everything else that can catch the eye. Like it just, it had to be more sound to be a stunning photograph then I think. Yep. Yeah. Less to rely on and less less things to lean on as Not, a you don't have availability of cheap tricks really back then right you know and there's so much of that now like uh ai uh spot what's it called like the the healing thing now the generation uh generative fill yeah generative fill yeah that's dumb <laughs> <laughs> i feel like it, you're just not 
Okay, let's just make it on the computer then and not even do the photography. Like, it's just a different thing, which is fine, but it has none of the joy for me. Right. I like working with the found elements and like I'll change them a lot, but I I like that I found it and had to arrange it and working within that constraint. So yeah, Charles is the best. His portfolio is insane. Anyone watching this who doesn't know it, you need to check out every single photograph. He has um, quite a bit of stuff on his website now, yeah? He has a lot. He has, I okay. think all of it or, or way more than his book even. I mean, it's really extensive and you can go by state. He has a lot of Southwest stuff too, but he's mainly a Yosemite guy. Cause some of the, some of the, um, you know, some of that generation, they have websites, but they have like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe one portfolio and, and all their stuff is like in physical it's galleries. Like 400 or pixels books. wide too. Cause it was from when like <laughs> image theft was a concern, like when stock was big and yeah, Charles is, yeah. he's, I taught with him at out of Yosemite in a post-processing session. That was like one of the best things I've ever had the privilege of doing, not just that session, but being in that uh, group of people. And like, I was so surprised that for such an old master, he is such a technical guy. Like people say about Ansel too, like he, Charles is like a curves nerd. Like he uses, he doesn't use luminosity masks, but he is like really technical about perfecting all the little stuff in his images. And he just uses simple tools like curves. Um, I forgot why I brought that up. There was a thread there. I think in a, I think he writes for Elements Magazine as well. And I think he goes into some of those technical details around using curves. Is that correct? Yeah, he has a column. So every yeah. issue he writes about yeah. some kind of post-processing technique. So a great plug for <laughs> Elements, which is an amazing magazine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he teaches, like, he's a master printer and teaches print, print workshops. Like mm. if I were to take any workshop, I think I would want to take his printing workshop. Like in being in Yosemite, doing a pr printing wor workshop with Charles Kramer sounds just like, maybe I should get on that since he is, he is getting older. Yeah. Another guy that I've heard has incredible prints is Christopher Burkett. Like uh, my friend, Jim Basia that I was talking to the other day was saying like, if you see a Christopher Burkett print in person, you'll just like never want to print one of your photos again. Like it's just so <laughs> incredible. I mean, have you seen the PBS thing that yeah, shows uh -huh. like just, sure. it's on YouTube, I think you should check it out. Or you, you have seen it. I haven't. I've seen like, it yeah. for sure. I mean, yeah, he's they, a local guy. There's he's a little a behind guy. the scenes stuff. Well, he, I don't think he's in Vernonia anymore. I think he's, he's not that he moved? somewhere else. Yeah. He was near Portland in Vernonia. Oh, I didn't know that. But and, uh, and he also other... he said that he'd quit shooting when Sibachrom ran out, like when he ran out of his stock of Sibachrom, because they don't make it anymore. Like that would be the end of his career. Has that happened? Uh, that's then? a that's a kind of film. Yeah, yeah. That's like what all of this. And then stuff he also on. like was using a certain kind of paper. I forget what it's called. And he only has like so much in like storage, like yeah. in, in some kind of special like freezer storage or something like that. And he says once he runs out of that, he's not going to print anymore either. Jeez. I just can't see that. <laughs> when I see the next photo come up. <laughs> Swing. <laughs> Sorry. I just can't imagine giving up photography like that. Like if well, you if it's yeah. been such a huge part of your life and you are so talented. Like his book, Christopher Burkett's book, The Intimation of Trees. I think that's the first, I can that never would, say the word properly. I didn't put that in the stack. Yeah, yeah. but that but is such a beautiful, beautiful book. Like if you love trees, like he and Charles Kramer are just masters at tree, tree yeah. portraits. Yeah, that's like a majority of my inspiration on trees right there. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice looking stack of books you got back there. That one on the top looks really sick. <laughs> it's all right. Oh, through the curve. <laughs> You're using it as a coaster. Yeah, that's just I keep my Nalgene. <laughs> kind of like a stand so I can reach it easier, you know, <laughs> arm level. I usually use it for my uh my dog's crate. Just <laughs> well, I could go on about Charles's work forever, but you limited me to eight total mm -hmm. photos. 
some of these were really difficult to pick just one. Actually, most of these people, all of them. Yeah, what would you say are kind of the the recurring like themes or aspects of photos that you consider to be great? Mm, well, it's so subjective, but I'm trying to get zoom out of full screen so I can look at the ones I chose at least. Like for you personally, like what makes a great photo? For me, Simple it's um, well, composition and light, number one. Like I just can't get into it if there are issues with the composition, but assuming that all of that is nailed down um, more subjectively, just like if it transports me somewhere else, if it feels like its own world and not like a mere um, facsimile of reality, I guess, like even, even like grand scenes that are very straight, like Alex Nails, for example, I feel transport me somewhere that I never have been and never will be. And they're just so evocative of that particular moment. But then there's a lot of photography that just feels, I mean, it feels so transparent to me that I don't really get into it. You know, I can just see everything that went into the creation and just um, too obvious. Yeah. Like it doesn't, I can't go anywhere with it in my mind because it's just, too on the nose, I guess. It's not like compositionally necessarily, but just like if I am fully aware of everything that went into it and, and there's no mystery at all, you know, it doesn't trigger my imagination. It's just very uh, straight. So I feel like all the photos that I love the most have like an ethereal or mysterious quality to them. They feel like their own little world. How do you think you strike that balance though between like having a photo be too vague, like too mysterious or like too obvious? Well, that's where I try to live with my favorite ones. It's like just enough context that it feels more like a scene. Like I, I have a lot of abstracts, but that's not really my favorite kind of photo. My favorite is the small scene with context and that doesn't have to be super quiet either. Like it can be incredibly stunning, like this photo of Charles's. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I mean, you have to be conscious of that. Like I have a propensity for removing all context and just drilling down to the simplest elements, which has served me well at times, but I would do well to remember, like Sarah said, that sometimes just zoom out a little more context can like create the world rather than make it so obtuse that nobody can get into it. Mm -hmm. I feel like for a long time I was shooting like everything mostly at 300 millimeters, like the far end of my main telephoto that I always use. And now I tend to shoot stuff at like 70 or a hundred, like more often than not, you know, a bit wider, but still, still tight, you know, so you can still yeah. be very picky with what you include, but. I like short telephoto. I feel <laughs> like most of my photos are probably below 300 millimeters. The ones that I like the most, like my favorites. I like having the 500 when you can't change your perspective, but yeah, I like some context too. Yeah. But still leave some mystery. So you don't give away all the clues. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just a balance to be struck, I guess. And it yeah, totally just, just allowing the, the imagination to interpret some of it and leaving some of it up for interpretation and, and yeah, engaging the yeah. imagination instead of just giving it all away. Yeah. Like this, this scene, I mean, you don't see the cliffs up above that the sun is peeking over or the um, sun itself or or the sun sky. itself and like if you don't know this particular spot in yosemite then i mean you could imagine any sort of whimsical forest in your mind and uh it just you have to fill in the information and become it becomes a thing in your mind that isn't reality but that's not the point for me it's like using the elements of reality to make something along those lines but more mysterious yeah. those are my favorite photos well i just poured another beer so before we move on uh, i'm gonna share this one this was hydra 5 a smoothie sour from mortalis sarah you would love this one is it like the what we had in zion yeah not the same one but same style oh, those, those were so good this get... one has uh, papaya peach pineapple vanilla and cream and it's seven percent and uh, there's Mortalis out of New York. We drink their beer on here a lot, so people are probably familiar <laughs> with them already. 
Sounds familiar. <laughs> I knew she would love those smoothies. They're, those yeah, Sarah good. loves them. Their stuff <laughs> is so, like, I don't think I've had something bad from them. I mean, it's some I didn't care for, but they're all just, like, really well done. You know? I think if you don't care for them, it's just about the fruit. Like, you just don't like that particular right. fruit, or it's not like anything was done wrong. Right. I mean, maybe like, yeah, exactly. And some of their IPAs, I don't, I don't quite care for them, but, um, but they're, they're good. But. It's just not yeah. what you expect from something called a beer. <laughs> right. True. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking like about the texture. Paul's, <laughs> like you said, where, when does it become wine? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> or not a beer. Exactly. Just like it's in a dark bottle with a wax lid and it's 14% and it's been aged. I'm like, aren't you talking about wine? <laughs> like, <laughs> I've got myself a very special second beer. Another one? Yeah. I'm waiting for you to bust out the joint, man. The gummies, the... I would never do that. I'm in Utah. I don't break Oh, yeah, the true. So, so I uh, cracked open another one as well. Um, and uh, Eric's probably going to hate me for this one, but this is... Uh, Holy Ghost from Parish Brewing. Um, oh. So uh, yeah, I, I I only managed to get my hand on two of these things. Um, well, we've we've passed that one up the last two years. We didn't grab it last year. We could have, and we didn't grab it this year. I've been curious about it, but I I, don't, I can't say you it, it, it's really good, but I think I like some of the others a little bit better. Um, this like one's the like Ghost in the Machine ones. Yeah, I haven't had the the latest batch yet, but uh, but it's it's really tasty it's 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 been sitting here for a while so it's kind of opened up pretty nicely warmed up i, I cracked one as well boys and girls. did you open that new brujos release paul that's what it looks like it's it's amazing this thing oh man it's good i let it warm up just a little bit right there and uh you're gonna help me out with the name eric What's that, baby? Thank you. I knew you would kill it. Yeah, this one came out uh, last weekend. Stood in line for an hour and a half. I'm a loser. And I got uh, three cans for each one of uh, the network members here. Uh, it's an Imperial Hazy. Uh, Citra and Nelson Hops comes in at eight and a half percent. It's it's great. I think this might be um, one of my favorites of the release over the last wow. six months out of there. It's It's great. And it's, and it's fairly new still. So, I mean, I've got three cans. I'll probably let the other two step for, you know, another week or two, let them settle down a little bit, but I couldn't help it. I really wanted to dip into this one tonight and uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Belina didn't go with you for that release. Is this no, Bruno? Yeah. That yeah. Bastard. So he, uh, he, he picked me up some, I'm not sure if it's that one, but. It's the one before that you 24? got yeah yeah it's been, uh, hard to get them yeah just yeah for sure um and you never know what the commitment is while you're standing in line you don't know if you're going to get two four packs or if you're going to get a case so that kind of uh yeah. that's a little bit rough but uh it's a little <laughs> bit of a commitment but uh definitely definitely worth it it was good it's really good you, you folks yeah, will enjoy it I assume they'll increase production to at least drop something once a week once they're open to and yeah they'll they'll want to have cans to go like on site as much as possible so I would assume so yeah when I was in there last week I mean construction's coming along but they had a big cooler up front where you know they'll definitely have to go beers so they're going to have to start uh, up in production quite a bit it'd be kind of interesting to see if um, like quality drops as well as they scale upwards and produce more frequently. not right away but eventually maybe it will hopefully it won't that's that's the sad story behind every brewery unfortunately yeah so that's why you got to get them while they're like brand new that's when they're making the best stuff and then once everybody knows about them by then they're usually not as good anymore so the hipster mentality exactly <laughs> or the crypto the shit coin mentality <laughs> seriously what is this wow where was the bunny? Uh, no, I remember when I first saw this one, I was like, what the hell? Like, it looks like some kind of like CGI, like uh, Blade Runner scene or something. <laughs> that's exactly what I thought. And the thing is, you know, coming from Alex Nail, that's mm. just how it was. So. 
It's the Drakensberg, yeah, the Mweni Pinnacles or whatever. I think he has it named on his site. So yeah, South Africa, crazy. It's my favorite photo of his by far. It's just it has that element of mystery, you know. And I love pretty much all of his work, but this one is just like something else. I've never. It's seen like the light is like coming it. from the ground or something, like like a searchlight or something. Yeah. Right. Super killer. And the mountains Great. just feel like shadows, or like these ominous. They're shapes. these, yeah, imposing. Yeah, I've, just, I've never seen anything like it anywhere. It's crazy. In nature photography. It only looks like nature doing Blade Runner, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is really cool. Yeah, this one's incredible. Um, I'm a big fan of Alex's work too. I actually will be getting his book in the mail any day now. By the time this airs, I'm sure I'll have it, but uh, very yeah. excited for that. But yeah, I love, um, I love how he just like, uh, yeah, relies on composition mostly and then. And light. He's right. like the, the best potential um, endorsement for planning a photo. Like, I know he does a lot of planning because I just watched the interview with Matt Payne and like conditions and stuff. Yeah. Like just going up a mountain 10 times and like planning for a weather window and kind of knowing what you're after. And he mentioned like having a particular composition that he never got to, but he went up this mountain 10 times and wanted to get that particular composition in the right conditions. But like his photos never feel trite or they also don't feel really rigid and like overly planned. They feel like very natural and like he just was there in the moment even though you know so much had to go into it mm -hmm. like we i always talk about just going out and seeing what i find which is how i operate but like he's like a completely different approach and i still am in love with the results right there's no right or wrong approach to photography it's just about what suits you best personally according to your preferences and personality and experiences you want to have he works really hard which is <laughs> I work really hard on certain things, but I do not work like he does on <laughs> you know, making these photos, finding them, getting up there, being up there. Yeah, it's like. I think uh, I don't mind the work aspect of it. I just think like it for me, it just feels too predictable. It's like once I take the photo, I'm not surprised because I've already seen it in my head and been thinking about it for, you know, every time I've hiked up that mountain or something like yeah. I, I have photos that are similar situations. Like I went back year after year after year and like, you know, got skunked over and over again by smoke or no clouds when I needed clouds or too many clouds and got no light. But then when I finally get the photo, like it's not, I don't know. Yeah. It's just like not as surprising and it's not as special feeling because it's just like, I've already seen it before. That one in the winds that I told you about the summit you've been up. Yeah. That I... one took me like four years. But I, I used to look forward to that so often. Sarah knows about this too. And like, I would talk about this photo that I wanted to do. And I just lost all interest when I realized that like, it'd be really cool to have. It'd be like, connect me to the experience, but it wouldn't be satisfying to make in the way that finding something new is. Like it doesn't, Right. that's why I haven't been up yet. Um, well that, and I haven't actually been up to that base in, in years, but if I was up there, like I wouldn't feel the need to go get this photo that I planned years ago because I just don't think that's what drives me. Yeah. Like, what I'll say, like, I think it took me seven. I had to summit that mountain seven times before I got that particular shot that I have in my portfolio. And, every, and the, especially the first time, but every time I summited that mountain was like a special experience, you know, just being on top of there, looking out at the view, but mm -hmm. the photograph itself isn't like, the it's experience just kind of, is, yeah, yeah, the you experience, know I mean? yeah. Now, I have photos like that too that I like just because they take me back to a good experience, and I don't. The photo isn't blowing me away necessarily, but even though the photo, like the scenery, is crazy, like it one is, of the craziest yeah. views I've ever photographed. But it's just at this point, well, the audience, it's new to them, you know, like they've never right. seen a sawtooth ridge like that probably ever in person or very much in photos even. Yeah, and. uh it's it's new to them even if you're bored of it at by the time you make it but 
I just, what I just enjoy the most is like just going out hiking, having no idea what kind of photos I'm going to make. And then like something happens, you shoot it and you're like, wow, that is so cool. I never expected that. Like those are the photographs that like in terms of the actual photograph, I end up liking the most later on. Yeah. Well, for me, photography is a mental game, like as evidenced by the dad bod, but I <laughs> beyond dad you work with your head like, and not with your legs. Beyond meat. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I do. I mean, like I'll I like if it's not right by the side of the road. Like I like if there's a little challenge in finding the place, but I don't think that it becomes more satisfying if I had to hike up a mountain, you know, ten miles and three thousand yeah, feet. I think, to I get think the, the main photo. thing is like the quality of the experience. Now, if you're in a quiet place, there's no other people around that are frustrating you or annoying you, <clears> stuff throat> like throat> that, you know, because mm -hmm. side of the road is like, you know, cars are passing by. It's hard to get yeah. into that. Well, I was thinking like a dirt road, but yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's especially bad when there's traffic. And sometimes, I mean, there are some times where there's just something so amazing <laughs> and that's the right perspective is near the road sure. because they build roads in awesome places in the U S but yeah, I, it's a mental game for me. And so like the planning aspect doesn't satisfy that for me. Like after finding the shot initially going back again and again. And I have to imagine right. this photo from Alex is a little different in that this is nothing he could have planned because this one feels you, spontaneous. You would never even see these pinnacles in this way when you're there. Like you would never imagine they could possibly look like this. Yeah, it's exactly. It's super beyond like so dependent reality. on that moment. And that's like, the exact sort of thing that I hope to find every time I go out. <laughs> yeah, the stuff that's like so otherworldly, you can't even preconceptualize it. I think that's the reason that I'm not as into the planning. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for Alex and people, Alex Nail and people like him that have the planning orientation and that they are willing to go up to the same place 10 times to try for something. But I just, I think for my own photographic style, it, it would feel like every single one of those times I would be missing so much, so many other things. And that, that I think that would cause more, like, like I would just feel like I'm giving up on all those other opportunities for this single-minded pursuit that keeps on not working out. So why don't I just do the things that I'm passing along the way that are, have sparked my interest? Like stop at those <laughs> things. Don't be like single-minded on this other thing at the end of the trail. So it's just like, there's no right or wrong. I think it's just what, works best for you and yeah, photo wise it's about to find the, that out about yeah. the journey and not the destination for you mm -hmm. and like that i learned probably when uh bellino and i went up on rainier in the winter like that was my first lesson in holy shit all this stuff that i worked for and planned i don't give a shit about it compared to what we found like a quarter mile from the parking lot <laughs> yeah like it's not that it was closer and easier it's that it was better yeah, so. I think for me, that was kind of my transition. Like I would have something in mind, but I would end up noticing more and more other things as time went on. And then I just realized like, I just shouldn't have anything in mind and just be completely open to those other things that will probably happen if I'm just out and looking at everything and just not trying to focus too hard on any one thing or like try to find anything that matches some kind of preconceived image in my head. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now I feel like I'm way more prolific because of that. Um, I don't know if the images are better, but I definitely make more images that I like now. Well, and what's and important, I guess, is if you enjoy making them. Yeah. yeah. And to interrupt. Right. I have way more fun. Yeah, it's it's more playful. And that's kind of the hidden game of photography is our inner experiences while creating and being out in the field and kind of discovering and and framing and experimenting is that our audience doesn't really see that. Like we have no idea this is planned or not. Obviously it's not probably planned, but an act of discovery and seeing something which you had no preconceived notion of when you left the, the house or the tent that morning, um, for me is also super rewarding. That's like the best aspect of photography. And I think it does help round out portfolios. I feel like, you know, um, if you're paying attention to every step of the way, you're gonna discover things more than if you were just to kind of say, I need to get to this spot because the sun is rising. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna predict that there's gonna be this, this confluence of conditions in 15 more minutes. But we just allow ourselves just to kind of rest in the moment and just discover that's like, for me, for sure, my favorite style of photography. 
And again, like Erica, as you said, it may not relate to the best images or the most you know, like eye popping grabbing images, but for me as a, as a photographer, like those are where the most rewarding images come. Um, those ones where you have no idea in the morning that that's what's going to be given to you and, and, and experienced when you're out in the field, for sure. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. But I mean, as I said, Alex is like the best possible example of what can be done with the planning. And I love his first book and I can't wait to it, get his yeah. second one. Yeah. Just, I just squeaked in before the pre-order ended on his second one. Nice. It was very affordable with shipping and everything. So yeah, I was surprised. Well, he said in that interview that he's eating half the cost for U.S. shipping on the pre-orders anyway. So thanks, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> he just wants to get it in more hands, which is understandable. So Krista has been on here several times before, but um, when I first saw this image, I think it was on Instagram, I just was like, what in the actual fuck am I looking at? <laughs> in this a is, way, it kind of yeah. looks like architecture, but I knew it wasn't because it looks like mithril to me. Mithril. Yeah, or, or like some chain armor. I have that same uh, response to most of her work. <laughs> it's This is like, remember I was saying that abstracts become so obtuse, but this is like so remarkable that it then becomes insane again and like has all this mystery, you know? It's. I feel like that is a lot of Chris's work. Hmm. And you know that it's coming from nearby where she lives while she's walking around. It, it's it, yeah. you know, <laughs> It's like what did you see? No, what did you notice this time? I have. I still have no idea what this is to you, Sarah. I have no idea. I think I might know what it is, but I don't want to say unless okay. I'm. She I'm explained it her. in the caption, or I asked her. Is it like a shell or an comment. organism, a macro? If I remember correctly, it's like, I don't even remember actually. It's something coastal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's something yeah. coastal. It's like hmm. scales of a fish or something like that, like uh, a dead fish or, hmm. or like yeah. some kind of thing. But it's I like, think... it seems like it's extreme macro. Yeah. That it might be like... some kind of diatom, but I'm not. Sure. Like this would be like that. two to one <laughs> scale instead of one to one. Yeah. They have that five to one deep. macro lens, the Canon. Mm. It's like basically a microscope, not really a field friendly lens, but she also does a lot of um, like studio work, like setup compositions, which are incredible. It just shows that yeah. like she well, has a great I'll say design. like, I don't typically enjoy studio stuff, but her stuff I love. Yeah. yeah. It's so yeah, normally it would it would not do much for me because it was set up, but hers is just like still so whimsical and and the design is so eye catching and it's still so natural looking, like very flowy and. It's a bryozoan, which she refers oh, yeah, to bryozoan. as the micro the microscopic <laughs> masons of the sea. She does have a nice Edward Weston quote with it. I want the greater mystery of things revealed more clearly than the eyes see, at least more than the layman, the casual observer notes. I would have a microscope, shall have one someday. Hmm. So just like very carefully looking at very, very small things and seeing what 99.9% .9 of people would just walk right past without a second. Yeah, she's thought. incredible. No I question. I would say she's like in my top five favorite photographers for sure. And was the moment that I found her like instant, instant favorite. Yeah, she's, oh, she, yeah, she's one where you can just look at any of her work, literally any gallery or page, and you will see immediately that she's like top tier. Like you don't have to go searching. And that's why I found it so difficult to pick one from her. But um, this one, I remember just my reaction when I first saw it and still now. Like I still don't understand what I'm looking at, even though you told me, but it's very <laughs> compelling regardless. Like the design is so strong. It's like a really good argument for your know, composition being so important too, because that's all we have here. We don't have the context of the scene, even with the words that describe it. Mm -hmm. It's entirely reliant on the visual design and it's just like all of her work. So, yeah, so good. So good. Mm -hmm. 
looks like there are like little rivets in some of them, you know? Like yeah, it does. The little circles. Like that's part of why it feels like chain mail to me. Yeah, it almost looks mm -hmm. like bricks, like laid out, and some of them have like popped up. Yeah. You know, like a cobblestone. Nature thing. is crazy. Sarah <laughs> is like another of the best macro small photographers I'm aware of. And I feel like your portfolio again is like an endorsement for this sort of like looking small and overlooked elements becoming extraordinary. Just... Yeah, there's the closer you look there, more there's the more there is to photograph. I think if I were to buy another lens, it would be the macro, especially because it goes past one X. The, I almost got the that Canon, one. The RF. Yeah, the Canon RF macro lens, the 100 millimeter macro lens is a 1.4 X mm. now. So y you can get. And then if you do crop mode on top of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's it like opens up all sorts of cool opportunities. Just on I a normal got... camera. I almost got the other Canon one, the 5X one, but you also need like a slide mount because like... It's basically you, a microscope. You can't zoom, you know, so you have to, if you want to like get the focus right when you're in, like <laughs> as close as you can be, you got to move the actual lens, like very minute. Got to have a like, center column for that one. That's the one you use. <laughs> yeah, Krista's work is incredible and I think she's very underappreciated. Anyone who's seen her work is appreciated, but she just mm -hmm. doesn't have like the massive reach where everyone's always talking about her and I think they should be so she also seems incredibly confident in what she does which I really appreciate that it's like when you see her work you know it's a, a completely authentic expression of who she is as a person and what she's interested in and the places that she the place like around her home that she loves deeply so Nova I, I think that's yeah not a big yeah, you can just tell hotspot. like she's having so much fun like she's just playing with it and like you can just feel that she has a genuine fascination for nature yeah and uh i always tell people you know like if you don't really care about the things you photograph like people can people can tell they can sense that in your photos and so the other way around as well like if you really care about the things you're shooting people are more likely to care about the photos that you make as well yeah she's not showing up to get something on a checklist and then keep moving you know like no. she's not a temporary visitor she's very much involved in it yeah part of the ecosystem mm -hmm. yeah yeah she has a lot of admirable qualities yeah she seems really cool um yeah i mean she's made it on bruise and views several times now though man she's definitely getting her name out there <laughs> 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 Dude, we have like 100, 165 yeah, yeah. followers now, something like that. That's pretty big yeah. time. Subscribers. Yeah. You have some pretty um, ardent fans, though, because after I was on, I got a lot of messages. So the people That's a that quality watch, following. Yeah, it is a quality Please. following. You want to know why? Because you have to be to listen to six people talk for three hours. <laughs> you either like it or you absolutely don't. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> There's People no like wishy washy fans, those kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no wishy washy fans like checking it out every now and then. Yeah, just casually year. popping in for a three hour yeah. sesh. Like it's <laughs> <laughs> It's the diehards. You do it on yeah. purpose, man. Gotta weed them out. Gotta yeah. uh, weed out the chaff. If you don't like it, you can get out. <laughs> yeah. I think this uh this spring, um and into summer, Krista, well, out in Nova Scotia, it was a combination of like smoke and forest fires and floods. And it really kind of, I think she could speak quite a bit about, you know, like climate change, changes and impacts and stuff. It's really quite a, quite a summer in Eastern Canada or everywhere. But. So David Ward is a hmm. photographer that I don't think I had heard of until fairly recently when Alex Nail actually like hmm. recommended I check out his work a while back when we were talking about something but uh yeah it's he's cool, got some right? really cool expressive and uh artistic work for sure I don't think that this photo necessarily represents his work again um very well but I really liked it because I'm a sucker for dunes and I just love that fall off of light in the background and, and that's a 
bird or something in the scene. Like it's a wildlife shot. So for yeah. anything to, I thought it was two people at first, but looking closer, I think it is an animal. It's called something watcher on his website. Hmm. And I think he may have described what it was, but um, I'm pretty sure that's part of what makes it special, you know, cause it's a, it's a fine composition otherwise, but I, I feel like the composition could probably be refined a little more, but it's wildlife. So you don't have long to shoot the frame and it's rare that you ever see this good of a context around wildlife in Namibia. But I was saying his work is like, I just found it because of Alex Nail recommending him on Matt's podcast. Wow. And he has such an insane eye for composition, like Charles Kramer level where it's like every single one is flawless and seeing the beauty in every element of the scene and not you know, being afraid of the so-called ugly things. And I just really loved his work and connected with it because it felt so tactile. Like I feel like the light is a big element in his work and mm -hmm. you can feel it in every single photo. Um, so he has some that are just like smaller scenes that I think I would normally overlook and that I know are very difficult to compose, like just stones on the coast that turn into like this incredibly gripping photo. Yeah. With like awesome motion and like, uh, even though they're like, uh, static objects, there's like this yeah. feeling of movement. There's a lot of energy to his compositions. He's yeah. like a master of flow, um, more than almost anyone else I've seen. And, this photo doesn't necessarily represent all that. I just kind of fell for the Dune thing. Um, yeah. But right. yeah, he's he's incredible. And I didn't know about him until Alex Neal recommended it. And he also has and... like the Grand Landscapes, which I think Alex was saying is what he was into from David Ward. And does he shoot digital or I don't film? Know. Medium, large format, maybe? I mean, it the images have such an incredibly like sharp, uh, like they kind of have that medium format look. I don't know if I'm the talking depth. to my ass, but like the, the detail feels insanely well resolved and like the light, but maybe it's just really good at processing too. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He has a very intimidating looking camera setup on his about me page that is, it looks like a film camera, but you can't okay. see the back. So it could be a digital back. I don't it know. does have a look to it, I think, like large format. I think you can tell a lot of the time. Like I remember Anthony Spencer used to shoot, or maybe still does, medium format. And like I saw some of his photos of White Pocket, and I was like the detail. I just couldn't put my finger on how it looked quite how it did. And I think that yeah, the gigantic medium helps with that. And also like a tilt shift lens, like getting that yeah. crazy depth. David clearly a shoots a lot of... Plane stuff with the angled plane like he has full depth of field on small scenes that would be a focus stack now and i can't imagine he's doing a focus stack being that he's been doing it for so long and seems to be such a practitioner of like just the gosh composition you know i actually feel kind of bad that i chose this photo because i see some things in the composition that i would like to change and but but he has like a million photos that I would never possibly be able to make that I, I just couldn't choose. I had a really hard time choosing. Well, I mean, this photo is awesome, but we always encourage people to go check out the full portfolios, preferably yeah. on their website. So those links are in the show notes here for people to go check out and do some more studying and research after they watch this. Because yeah. like I said, you can't do a photographer justice like for their whole portfolio with just one image. Like that's also not the purpose you know you, you take images of different things to represent different ideas and feelings and that's how a well-rounded body of work is but um yeah um mm -hmm. uh, i'm on his site now it's phenomenal he's incredible. got some he's got some i've i follow him on instagram but i haven't, I haven't been on his website before and he's got some really incredible stuff yeah you can get lost Something, in, like i've been a fan of his for a while now and um I mean, when I first saw him on Instagram, I think I discovered him on Instagram. I literally spent probably a half hour going through his feed and then his website after that. I'm um, super tight, intimate, not just only nature, but just some like rope kind of design. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, He's kind of like got an art. Yeah, just go out there and just, if you don't know of his work, just go find his work, go to his website and, it, and just get lost for like a half hour. It's, it's well worth it. 
crack open a beer and sit yeah. there and check it out. He's incredible. That's it. Never yeah, touched. He floored me. The person I saw his work, he just is so different and he just absolutely floored me for sure. That's the best when you find someone new and they just have like such fresh stuff compared to what you've seen before and you just get that excitement again. It just makes you want to go out and take some yeah. photos and yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. I felt that with him and I just found him yesterday. So it was good timing that I watched that episode, <laughs> Alex. Nice. Something you said earlier is like, uh, he has an ability to photograph objects that are like, uh, less pleasing, like not conventionally beautiful, maybe like grotesque or, uh, decaying. Right. And I feel like what I've come to believe in recent years is like, if you have like the skills and you're very creative and then most of all, you have like a real deep relationship with nature, you have that ability to like still find the beauty, like some kind of beauty in those things, even if it's like disturbing or ugly or like, um, you know, like in death or like anything like that. Like that's just kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the gift you receive from being an artist, like being able to see those things in throughout life, like even in experiences and stuff that happened to you. Um, yeah, I think that's something really special. Yeah. I, I see that in someone's work like Davis and it reminds me that I need to let go of perfectionism, at least in terms of the included elements. And like, he is a perfect example of perfect compositions with imperfect subjects, you know, and I feel like I go too often for clean and perfect in every aspect, but he's, oh man, just arranging the chaos and the, the less pleasing things and the design, the flow, actually, the thing, the <clears throat> fact that you mentioned that right away, I think it really comes across that like all of his compositions have a lot of energy, even on totally static subjects. That yeah. is something I could work on too. Like, it's just very inspiring to see. Because that's created by the way you frame it. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's totally due to the way the photographer captured the scene. It's not like innately there. He's using some wider angles and getting up close on things and yeah, perspective. utilizing that perspective to create some of that. I mean, I couldn't possibly choose. I did choose and now I regret it because there's just so much more. <laughs> this one's awesome. <laughs> but I, I mean, no, it is. Yeah, yeah it's a really nice photo. Check out his but website I don't know it's that it's even getting brilliant. across the energy because it's more of a layer shot, you know, and a lot of his have, he has a lot of verticals with kind of like a flowing uh, sort of composition. Really yeah, most of his or many of the photos that I've looked at just now have all been verticals, which mm. just feels uh, it's it's always interesting to look at somebody who's as a U, somebody who's based in the US to look at somebody from the UK or some other place and like you just like it's just a different feel. Aesthetic, and look yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like everything outside of the US isn't as good. <laughs> <laughs> I just okay. I just had a brunch with Halgrid Milan here from South Africa. I'd never met him before. And he's here in the US for the first time. And he spends a lot of time in South Africa, Namibia. He's been all over. And he is so incredibly floored by what we have in Utah alone. Like we really do have I'm sure he is, man. That's why I live here. Insanely good. <laughs> no, but like for someone that look at this place in the photo. I mean, he has access to Namibia, and he's like, ah, whatever. Like Utah beats it easily. You know, like it's. I don't want to speak for him too much, but he was just like really, really taken by our landscapes and just the amount that we have accessible to us, like for yeah. free. But or for very I'm cut cheap. you off there, Alex, because what is funny is Utah actually sucks, and no one should waste their time coming okay. here. Jersey. Well, I'm not worried about if they come here because they're going to go to Salt Lake City probably and crowd you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be okay. St. George is the, the fastest growing city in the I'm world. I'm not in St. George, the US. Yeah. But yeah, it is, it is crazy how fast it's growing. I don't live right in St. George because it's way too busy for its own good. You and Herkin? Like, Ivan's. Herkin, Leverkin. I'm on the west side up by Snow Canyon and it's very quiet and but it's really close to St. George, like 15 minutes. What's your address? 
<laughs> you could probably drive around Ivan's and find me. I don't think it's that big. If you see some eggs on your house, you know who it was. Eggs. You're gonna like TP his house like in high school, like a high schooler. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> I'm renting, I'll just break the lease. All the too expensive now, man. You don't, don't have big enough is. trees to TP your house either. No, we we just have like Cactus. two palm trees in the front. Random it's like, like rabbit brush. It's just a rock yard. Yeah, so before we get into uh Michael's photo, I just wanted to say that I had a different Michael chosen. Not instead of Michael Fry, but one that is like kind of infamous for things that have happened. And I decided that I didn't want to, I felt like I would be derided for elevating his photography or like saying all these good things about it. <laughs> so I chose a Michael that I know to be a really good guy and dropped the other one. The other one was uh, Mike DiMiola. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Renowned for his uh, charring of southwestern icons <laughs> oh, i know what you're talking about yeah yeah anyway that is he's still around though um i remember seeing uh somebody like spotted his vehicle on the road and he has a <laughs> the light hunter says, like yeah oh, yeah like, it probably so says funny. it all over the side yeah so aggressive it is straight you know, but, like i'm gonna you know, hunt that light down i'm gonna find it <laughs> when i do <laughs> <laughs> and when I do, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I like the photography, but I wanted to get my hands on that about the rest of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna skin it. And, okay. like, I'm gonna it. skin it, boy. <laughs> Mount it on the wall. <laughs> Trophy. Uh, that's so bad. <laughs> I, I think I like this photo more anyway, but uh, you know, just had to admit that that photo I had originally chosen was like one of my favorite photos ever. But I decided that you should, I guess, separate art from artist and choose like a good artist as a person too. Michael Fry is both an incredible artist and a great guy. So here we are. <laughs> this is good super intro. beautiful. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, this one's crazy. It almost looks like inverted, you know, like yeah. uh, color inversion or something. Like it looks super trippy. That's what got yeah. me about it. The light parts kind of play with your eye and it feels like a drawing or something unreal about it, you know. Mm -hmm. But I know that it's pretty, it's got to be pretty real if it's Michael Fry. Michael shoots digital, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But a practitioner of the old ways, I think. I mean, he's like a big right. Lightroom buff too, but I don't think that he's doing anything... Uh, screwy <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah and we featured an image of his uh paul chose it um that might have been from the same series that he made at this particular lake but maybe not but yeah, yeah this one's super cool as well the thing that got me aside from that graphic quality is like remember i was saying that full-on abstracts don't necessarily like transport me the way a scene does but this goes so far as to create a scene within the abstraction like it looks like a range of mountains to me and lakes and that's why i love it so much mm -hmm. is that i can imagine it to be something else even though i know it's ice sure like an aerial mm -hmm. or something it mm -hmm. still allows mm -hmm. you to play around with it yeah the composition is flawless it's very well laid out but it's not overly yeah. obvious either where it's like a perfect zigzag or like a s curve it's like this staggered yeah, it has like, a natural feel to it yeah it's difficult to have like that organic feeling and then have everything like be intentionally placed but then not feel contrived you know because if yeah. everything's like too perfectly aligned it loses that organic feeling to it and mm -hmm. that's something i've been a lot more conscious of in recent years like mm -hmm. trying to like to intentionally be. create imperfection in a way or allow imperfection on purpose in a way that doesn't that's not detrimental to the photograph well that's that's i think the thing that i run into problem wise with composition is that i try to perfect it to the detriment of the overall photograph mm -hmm. and really you need to prioritize the overall flow instead of like individual elements that might not be perfect so i'm trying mm -hmm. to do that now but i don't know if i've even done it yet i still feel like it's really hard to get out of my own like mode, have my own form of tunnel vision, you know? 
Like I go out You're expecting right, anything. Man. No, no but you're doing I, pretty well, Alex. That's fine, but I go out and like with no expectations, but then I shoot with such a specific set of preferences that I might not make a photo even like this because like you just tried too harshly. I might have tried too hard to like make everything work to the point where it didn't have the flow and the feel that this one does. I don't know. I, it's just something I'm trying to work on. Like I love when photographers do it really well and it inspires me to be better. I like that he didn't go crazy with the colors. The pastels the, are so nice. Yeah, the pastels work really well. And the, the ice has a luminous feel that it's, it's hard to think. There's just something about the ice that like the transparency or there's something about it that I think just elevates it to like that otherworldly feel that you were talking about, Alex, like it transports you somewhere. Um, the, the pastel light and the pastel ice together just work so nicely. Yeah. Yeah. If it was too strong of a blue, it wouldn't feel luminous. And if the orange was too strong, it'd be distracting from the ice, which is really what it's about. But it's, I mean, it's perfectly balanced in every way, but also has enough imperfection like certain things overlapping and lines ending in places that don't feel like everything was meticulously placed. And I'm sure it was, but it doesn't feel that way. Michael is such a Are you smiling, photographer. Eric? <laughs> so fucking I funny. Pause for it. I was going to pause for a second. <laughs> I don't know if Paul's mic is too close to something, but... Uh... It was like I didn't want to say anything. Breathing. I forgot that we could. I forgot that we could just cut things out. Yeah, I've been getting a lot yeah. of breathing. I'm sorry. Is that me? I think yeah, so. You're like, yeah, you might you're be like breathing heavily, and uh, you're starting to. Well, you're not. You're breathing stuff. normally, but there's the mic is like getting. No, oh, sorry, sorry, guys. Sorry, no, I, I didn't want to interrupt before to say it. <laughs> Back off the mic, Darth. Man, that's. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. Better. Right. People will probably think it's me. It's like, oh, he's overweight. He's probably doing it. <laughs> it's just like labored breathing, just sitting there. But actually, it's just a mic thing. <laughs> oh, dude, like, we haven't so heard good. this before. As soon as Alex gets on the show, it's just like... <sighs> <sighs> this pastor's getting ready to go down. <laughs> About to pass out. Michelle. Good choice. Yeah, she's awesome. And this one I hadn't seen before and feels like even though the elements are all very familiar, it feels super unique. Like I don't know that I've ever seen this particular combination of like conditions and trees and that color of water. And like, it just feels very distinct, even though I've seen water and trees, all sorts of places. Yeah, I'd never seen this image before. It seems like it'd be difficult to include like water that's going left to right and then trees that are going like bottom <laughs> to top but the I way just that posted they're... a photo of that but it's it's yeah yeah that's kind of no, what but... i was thinking of <laughs> oh yeah yeah you mentioned that i thought you were just mm -hmm. because you had mentioned that to me i thought you were making a joke right now that's no I no i wasn't making a joke i was just uh admiring her ability yeah. to make this work and how like the ripples are like slightly angled so it does kind of like it's not completely sideways and like uh contradictory to the background flow but um yeah it did make me think of your new spring photo from yosemite uh spirit of the merced i didn't think about that when i picked it actually i only realize now that it's kind of the same elements but i don't think the like different directions really matter much it feels very natural and it has a flow to it i think just because the water like you said is not just at a slight angle but like very flowy it's not a rigid straight line of water other than the shoreline yeah this feels great i'm just saying like in general just shooting like opposing lines i think i i wouldn't i wouldn't know how to make it work probably and i think you know it, it in general it probably wouldn't work but I admire and the trees have some horizontal right lines too and and the fog softens them a little bit the fog softens it and the, the layout sure. of trees is horizontal like you have the staggered white trees throughout that kind of spread your attention out so it doesn't feel like 
you know, like you'd have to be a real idiot to just put one tree above the water, you know, like that, that, that's that like wouldn't work. That's like sunlight too, and yeah, that's just too <laughs> rigid, but like to have this many trees that spread <laughs> out horizontally. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and also here, like, it's pretty subtle, but I just noticed it, like, the bottom third is, like, darker, slightly brown water, and then you have that strip of green right in the middle, and then the top is kind of brown and also, like, monotone. There's some Uh red on the right, yeah. So you have the distinct layers, too. So it's almost a layer shot more than it is, like, a line shot, because I kind of see the tree layer as one contiguous thing rather than individual trees, which do catch your attention. But yeah, she's got yeah, a lot of great awesome. work, and I just tried to pick something that I hadn't seen before from her. I know you and, like her work a lot, Sarah. Did you feature one of her uh, one of her images on our episode? I don't remember. I was going to, but um, I had featured her in an interview recently as like somebody that I would recommend. So I didn't because I felt like I needed to spread the love around. But I just generally love her work. Um, I, like I said with Krista. I think Michelle is somebody who like her work embodies how she connects with the natural world. And it's a very authentic expression of who she is as a person. Uh, I, I, I think she's very comfortable with a softer color palette and uh, just generally softer compositions. And she's really like, she has an entire feminine landscape series. So I think like the, she's resisted the temptation to do the things necessary to attract attention on social media, for example. Um, and just stayed really true to herself and developed a beautifully cohesive body of work as a result. I agree. Yeah. It's, that, that's it's very well stated. It's definitely very cohesive uh, in terms of just the overall aesthetic and tone and palette. I love that. I loved her portfolio sections. Like it felt like they were very well considered. Like I don't have to think about that because I'm sorting by year and like I really appreciate when people are able to come up with something other than like desert and mountain and to create individual portfolios that still have a theme I don't remember which so one you think, this came so you out don't of, like my but... website is what you're saying you think... <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said it I mean I really just wanted to take a dig at you it wasn't, it wasn't about praising Michelle at all it was all about taking you down a peg <laughs> well played Alex well played. <laughs> photography is a mental game, and so are photography insults. <laughs> Chess, not checkers. Yeah. 4D. 4D chess for a 2D medium. Sarah, do you re- do you remember Sarah? Uh, like the she was help. She was working to like document a new addition to the national park. Yeah, this is from her New River Gorge series. She has an ebook on New River Gorge. Uh, so she had an artist residency there in February. So that's another thing to really respect somebody mm-hmm. for. To go yeah. to a new national park in February for an artist residency <clears throat> and create a compelling portfolio. Is this out east? That is an accomplishment. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. Uh, that's really cool. That's, oh, that's actually, what's really cool yeah, Taylor and I went there when right before it, we got became a national park or right when it did no right before so we didn't yeah yeah that's this place that's crazy that's really cool yeah i saw it and like i mean this sort of thing is not obvious you don't just like stroll up and come into a photo like this like she really had to explore it i'm sure because it doesn't look like the place that i saw i also saw it in fall but other than having like a general east coast vibe right it's cool she made like very much a distinct sort of body of work there and i think maybe that's why i was drawn to it because i've seen a lot of her other work and i've never really seen anything from this park with this particular aesthetic like her combination of artistry with these particular elements in that season like sarah said it's a new river gorge is that correct Mm -hmm. she can't lean on the fall color here you know like everything's bare and dead and most people wouldn't even consider going out the best time of the year man oh i i agree it's just there's no there are no cheap tricks to be had it's all like composition you know like yeah everything's exposed there's nothing to hide behind every line the fog helps a little but that's still yeah it's still laid bare and that's kind of what i really like about her work is it's so predominantly from the appalachia region 
and um it's kind of like this handful of emerging photographers james you and i think uh demiola as well mike are in that crew as well who are really diving deep into what the appalachian region really offers and it's something i really haven't seen outside of like fall color or spring creeks and things like that and so that's one other the reason I really appreciate her work is she's really taking a deep dive into a specific region. And I feel like she had, she had to grow into that as well. I think she's from England as well. Is that correct? Originally? Yeah, she actually, she has an ebook about her whole journey. It's free. Journey. So if anybody's interested about how she came to be more comfortable with working in the region where she is now, like it didn't feel like hmm. home, but now it does. Yeah. Very and cool. I'm, I'm being from Maryland as well, I kind of like love these West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, that whole area. And just to see so much amazing work coming from that area is just is um, very refreshing for me. Where exactly are you, James? So I'm in New York um, and Mike uh, lives like about like, you know, like 45 minutes, kind of like to the Northeast. So, But in Vermont, Mike, right? <clears throat> yeah, he's in Vermont. Okay. So the border is not too far away. It's kind of like a weird orientation. So I'm like in the Southeast Adirondacks, an hour north of the capital of New York. <laughs> so it's like Albany. this big area. <laughs> I know um, Albany because of the Simpsons. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, I also <laughs> learned the capitals, but anyway, if no one, Brent Clark will get that reference if he watches this. Locally, we call it Smallbany, but. Um... <laughs> or Smelbany. Cool. Do you ever do that? No, not quite. <laughs> I feel like anyone ever been through Tacoma, Washington? I'm sure Michael has. Oh, yeah, it always yeah. smells oh, yeah. terrible there, right? Yeah, and Paul. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like I heard a name about how Tacoma stinks like shit, but I forgot what it was. It was clever <laughs> too. I think Ron is Ron has said that before. I can ask him yeah. real fast if he remembers. <laughs> but you, you Ron's not you, in the house right now. He's upstairs. He just okay. walked by. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Noah Kahan and the in the stick season yeah. and all that. Like like this is literally what we stare at for yeah four stick or season five makes sense a year. And having been out there one time in fall into late fall where it started going bare, like I felt like I understood his music. And like I don't yeah. think you even need to have been there because the music says it all. But right. I get the like the aesthetic and the feel, and right. I respect it being from Wisconsin, which is a different sort of thing, but also kind of similar. Yeah. It's like yeah. a very quiet, uh, dormant time. Yeah. I, mean, it's, I like in it. In many ways, it's kind of my favorite season because it's just, it's so subtle and soft and quiet and peaceful yeah. and cold. <laughs> like the Southwest has that too, but it also, it also always has like the red rock kind of screaming at you. You know, it's not like as muted. Um, and the landscape features are still amazing. So it's a little different out here. Definitely has the dormant trees and stuff, but there's something about the Midwest and East Coast feels different. Mm -hmm. she yeah, Mich it. Michelle is awesome. Yeah, she captured. Yeah, she people. is. Glad you <laughs> chose one of her photos. It's the Tacoma aroma. That's what it was. <laughs> That's it. That is it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, I've heard of this guy before. I can't remember okay. where. So <laughs> I asked you if I was supposed to choose people that are like unknown, and I it doesn't I matter. Picked... I don't. When we have guests on the show, I don't want to. So like when we just do it ourselves, like the the main uh, cast, we try to feature people that are more under the radar if we can, because I think that's cool for people to discover new stuff. But um, when we have guests I on, I thought, but I just don't want to like. I don't I don't want to like coerce you or like I want I want your selections to be genuine so that you'll be like enthusiastic about them and just choose whatever you like. I don't want to be like, you know, oh, you should choose someone that hasn't been on before or have any kind of restraints. I respect that and I appreciate that because I feel like even photographers that we as people super immersed in the community with certain interests like in smaller scenes we we know all these people. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people watching, I'm sure they know William Neal, but they might not know this photograph of his from the 80s. Like they might mm -hmm. have seen what he posts on social media these days. And 
or like people that we know are just incredible photographers with their following is like not insanely large, even though they deserve it. So I felt like I just wanted to pick people that really, really inspire me, but not necessarily surprisingly, like we've actually a million never, followers. We've never shared a William Neal photo on the show yet. Wow. So that think. was 1994. Wow. Um, I was four years old. That is so yeah, crazy. I was, I was eight. So I picked <laughs> this one. It's, it's my favorite photo of his. And I we're friends now. And I joke with him that, uh, that he peaked early because like he hasn't <laughs> beat it since. It's been <laughs> almost 30 years and he just hasn't reached that high. It's all been downhill. <laughs> um, no, but I, I covet a print of it. I hope to one day own one for my home. And I feel like it's just, it's one of those images that has stuck in my mind forever. Like ever since I first saw it and I'll never unsee it. Like I'll always remember the things about it that inspired me in the first place. And it's kind of like when I do tree photography, like I aspire to have such flow and such a cohesive composition while still embracing the chaos of the trees and like incorporating like unique conditions and not just having, you know, an average tree shot, but an extraordinary tree shot. I just love this photo. So obviously Bill's awesome. A lot of people know that, but I don't think that I see this photo get a lot of play. So it's a great pick, Alex. This thing is phenomenal. Yeah, it is really beautiful. Like your point about the flow with the trees and uh, like the little hints of fall color against the blue background. Like yeah, and that tree even pointing in from the right, which I might see as like an intrusion if I were composing. Like I oh, need yeah, to the get... branches that are just... No, it's it. also like a good... And and he mentioned mentions this, that curve at the upper left. Like he, I guess resents that or regrets that a little bit but i think that's just how it had to be that curve just grazing the upper left edge um it doesn't bother me at all no it, it doesn't matter me. it doesn't matter it's just like because, little because things it's like curving that. like in the same well, direction right? as the other thing so it doesn't really stand out it's not like an outlier you know it's not like something oh there's, there's something plenty of things different. drawing your attention that are more contrasty to yeah and like more centrally placed it's not a problem it's just like these are little things that i might uh, think too hard about if I was making my own photo and mm -hmm. I really appreciate that he just let nature be nature I mm -hmm. love when people do that him and Charles and all of these people really it's just something I aspire to what's it been like leading workshops with Bill oh, it's terrible just <laughs> spending weeks with him at a time oh god I can barely stand the guy no he's He's really, really nice, really generous with his information. Like he's not like competitive at all. He's not trying to like keep locations from me. He's just like telling me stories exactly where he took photos and like willing to share everything. And I really appreciate hearing all that. But also we're just friends now, so it's fun. Like it's gotten to the point where we're like ribbing each other in front of the clients a little and you know, it's obviously not genuine because he is so well accomplished. If I say anything about his photography, like everyone knows it's a joke, but it's still fun because <laughs> that's what you do with your friends. So, yeah. Um, yeah, he's an awesome guy. It's been very rewarding to like get to know Yosemite with the benefit of him like, showing me all these amazing spots that are, you know, if I showed up on my own, I might have found some of them. I've, but like nowhere near the the ease of which I've been able to slide in and like just get in a really good position to make photos. And then teaching, like I love showing people how I see things for the first time because I think that's a something that is maybe the most important skill as a photographer is to be able to do it on your own, you know, without yeah, so the assistance they know, of a like workshop. How to approach a brand new place they've never been to before. Or... Yeah, so we're with Bill, so he knows like the valley inside and out and I'm I'm starting to like know when we'll go where and why based on light and conditions and all that but having him there and me being relatively new to it I really love uh being able to show people like how I'm exploring something for the first time and what I'm noticing because I feel like that's a skill that often isn't taken away from a workshop if you're doing like a checklist sort of thing like okay we're going here for this shot and just showing people the exact thing without showing them how you get there 
like how did you find that in the first place how did you yeah. know that this is the place how did you guys start one? teaching together like who initiated it um actually he and alistair had a workshop planned and then alistair had visa issues and couldn't make it over so they thought that i would be a good replacement and i'm really happy that that happened thank you visa <laughs> office or however that happened because <laughs> uh now we're in our well to, next year will be our third year of doing them together um we just work so well together and we have like different but still very complimentary styles just like me and tj do why i keep working with tj it's like well, Bill just and TJ like the way more... that you approach photography like the way you shoot and stuff yeah um... we like i'm the more analytical and bill and tj are more like based on feel and so i handle more like technical questions but we still have a lot of overlap on like what we see in the photos it's like when we're doing critiques we see most of the same things and yeah just works really well I'm really grateful for that yeah we'll have bill on the show at some point we'll see what he says about doing workshops with you <laughs> it's <be> totally different. <laughs> we'll get the real stuff <laughs> well, just wait till the recording ends, then you'll get the real stuff. <laughs> Tell you all about Bill Neal, that fucking guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's he's great though. Yeah, I had fun uh, doing that podcast interview, the three of us, a couple oh, of yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. Was that with Matt? Yeah, Matt Payne. Yeah. That was like the worst episode he ever did. <laughs> well, you can't expect much with Eric there. Just, got so lower I had expectations. Go, I had to go into therapy to get that out of my head. That was literally. <laughs> what the hell, Alex? You chose one of your own photos to feature? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> um, First off, like Yellowstone in the winter or early spring, whenever, whenever this was made, was um, a location and time I would love to photograph and I hope to do so one day. And Sarah, were you there as well? There's a like you and Jen and, and Dave. Sarah, Sarah and, and I don't know how much David and Jennifer were involved in the planning, but I know I had nothing to do with the planning. I just came along. So I have yeah. them to thank for this photo. So you know alex is riding their coattails into this scene a little bit yeah but well actually i wrote okay i rode my laziness TJ into went the scene. <laughs> they got up it wasn't sunrise yeah they got up for sunrise and snowshoed a long distance i did not get up for sunrise when they did i was hours late to get up even and i found this on the way so my laziness got me this photo yeah Ooh, yeah baby i so rode my own please. coattails you're your patience also because you waited on this for a long time right until the light was just right yeah and the the steam was like yeah. not always around these trees it was kind of swirling and moving with the wind so yeah took a while to get it like this there's some obvious things i love about the image the obviously the left tree with the snow caked onto it compared to the the two trees to the right so those two trees to the right were they windblown or were they kind of was the steam to like hot, hot for the snow to last long. i think they're closer to the steam and that's why they're not yeah. caked and yeah. the, the white one's actually quite a bit further back but yeah. you can't really see with the telephoto I but just the overall away. yeah and just the overall atmosphere and it, it sounds like you definitely waited on it and i'm waiting for that perfect moment to capture this image um just absolutely fantastic um as the person who loves tree photography and also loves fo photographing foggy scenes when I first saw this, this, you know, immediately grabbed me and, and made me in a very good way, envious and jealous and a very, Doesn't everybody <clears throat> love photographing foggy scenes, Michael. No, no one does. Just me. <laughs> you know, <like>. No <laughs> <laughs> one likes photographing foggy forest scenes besides the selection. Two of a kind. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, no one knows about it. This is like, this are sauce <laughs> out the there that no one is aware of. I hope nobody ever figures it out that it's actually a really easy yeah, way so to make a cut great that out tree photo. Just point thing. at it and you're good to go. Yeah, no fog, no fog. But yeah, I just love the, just the just the presentation here. What I love about your work also, Alex, is the details in the background. Like your background details are so, there's a softness, but a very palpable contrast as well. Looking at the right side, upper corner of the scene, 
just the snowy branches obviously the snow helps with the contrast but that's kind of an element of your work that i think is very um, noticeable for me is just how your background elements um also seem to be a slow reveal for me especially in these forests and tree scenes and you can kind of just take in those details after featuring or feasting on the main course um, in this case those three central trees um just and it goes to towards your processing style and your your ability to kind of bring forward subtle yet very poignant elements which makes an element or makes an image just rise above many others for sure i really appreciate that heartfelt yeah. analysis i really do thank you buddy. this feels a little bit like a roast where you say lots of terrible things and then you say something genuine at the end <laughs> i kind of throw a band-aid over all the new wounds that you i feel like you, you really did go easy on me compared to what sarah had to deal with in her episode. <laughs> Hey, she set herself up for it, photographing salmon spraying milk and posting the photos wow. online somewhere. Yeah, she she brought the she brought the pain. She brought the pain. I yeah, that's thank you. I I don't know. I mean, I definitely pay attention to backdrops and surroundings of the subjects, but I don't know that I did anything in the upper right here. I think it might have just been the, the natural way it, lighting. The way so it, it fell. Did. But I know that you know, in foggy stuff in particular, I'm pretty concerned with like overly contrasty patches and uh evening that stuff out so i know i did some of that but i don't know if it happened there yeah there's another image i wanted to choose which has that same element of a slow reveal and if you deep if you like like look deep into the image just the trees in the background and how they just appear and have perfect um contrast and, and brightness values is just amazing so yeah thank you Alex, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Brent Clark and I were backpacking together a couple weeks ago here in Utah. And uh, for some reason, he brought up this image and he said that you had removed it from your website for a while. And then you had like just recently put it back on there. Just for my favorites. he Brent is like the most studied student of my work. It's crazy. Like he knows <laughs> what photos are in what galleries. And I don't expect anyone to remember like a title of an image, let alone whether it was in a gallery or not Brent like goes to people's websites and like keeps an eye on it and like he notices if I, he's like texts me like oh i see like this this and this removed from favorites like five and, minutes like, after you change something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like i don't know i thought i didn't i didn't know i had an rss feed for the website you're like looking at your windows like uh, no doubt <laughs> yeah no brent's yeah i love Some that he, he, he just thinks a lot about curation it, like he and i talk about curation and selection and okay portfolios and I was stuff surprised, so that's why yeah, he said you'd removed it from your website and i was like really like, just from the photo? favorites but i think what what but now it's back in the favorites is yeah what bugged me about it was that it's kind of the flat plane sort of thing that i do where it's like everything lined up in one spot like the telephoto look and i am looking yeah, for more depth nowadays like a photo. little more a little more create or sorry a little more um context of like a in depth like like you were saying on Charles's photo and we've been talking about like, I want that more. So when I was looking at this, I was like, that's just kind of like a flat thing. And like, it's a little on the nose, like one versus two, like light versus dark, but I like it again. I like that. It's me. What made, but it's, what made but you it, change your mind? Well, I like, I like that. It's me. Like I haven't seen anyone with a photo quite like it. Yeah. So that ups the value too. Like I have photos that I like that other people have done really similar like things and they don't feel as much like they're mine. Like I just don't feel as much connection or ownership. So yeah. they don't. But then there's some like I have that um that pink badlands scene in my favorites right now because it was doing something for me, even though you have like the same shot in your book. It might go in my book. Except your book will say twenty eighteen and mine will say twenty nineteen. People think I went and copied Eric Bennett a year later, but I contend that it was New Year's Day. That we took it. <laughs> I think that it was New Year's Day 2019. I think your book's wrong. <laughs> oh, you think shit. it was New Year's Eve, but this is for the record. It was because I, I think owns both our books eventually. Because <laughs> I think uh, I think we like shot and then we partied for New Year's Eve. I don't think I shot anything on New Year's Day. I think I just hung out and then left. I mean, if that's the case, then I need to put 2018 on it so people don't think I went out and 
just tried to do an Eric Bennett one year later, but it's definitely what people think. Point being that like that, I mean, sometimes I just really like a scene enough. And Sarah did that before either of us. Like Sarah had a really nice shot of those badlands. So I just like it enough that it doesn't matter that it's kind of similar. Yeah, it's very similar. Sorry, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> I just feel like I mean that's kind of what you see from there, but it's yeah, uh, it's like there's the wash, like it's the it's the thing you're looking right down on. It's layers. like you'd yeah. you'd be hard pressed not. At least if with our style of photography, you'd be hard pressed not to make a photo sort of in that vein, at least. Yeah. Very yeah, the, the pink light that you guys had though was Oh, it was so phenomenal. good. Phenomenal. Yeah. You weren't there, Sarah? Why didn't you come with us? We were at a different set further, I think, west of where you guys were. I don't know why. Mm. Mm. You guys totally blew it. <laughs> <laughs> I have some nice photos from the other place. How do you guys like drink a bunch of beers and sit here for three hours without needing a break? Uh, we just get up and piss if we need to, but I mean, yeah. I, okay. Can we pause got, this then? Just don't mute your microphone. Yeah. I got the well, I'm not bringing this with me. It's attached. <laughs> we want to hear it. But I'll hear you. <laughs> if that does anything for you, I'll be able yeah, to hear you again there. In our and merch this, shop, though. we have catheters available. Yeah. <laughs> I got that. I got that old school trucker jug. That's what we were talking about earlier. <laughs> Dude, it's so funny. So this one, just one of those images where I first saw it, I'm not sure if it was on your gallery, on your website or online somewhere, just grabbed me. Um, and it is a complete scene. And it's a vertical, which for me, I've really had difficulty seeing vertical recently. Yeah, but um, an image like this is pretty inspiring. So you got an amazing use of framing. Uh, there's some framing at the small tree on the left with the left larger tree coming in, the nearer tree. And then you got that right tree on the right, the larger one, which is closest to the to the camera, of course, um, helping to frame the, the larger background, mid-ground tree. But when I saw this image, I took in all those details of the highlights, that luminous quality. And then all of a sudden I looked deeper into it. And I saw those dark trees in the background. And that's what really just made this image rise to a whole new level for me. And that little luminous, you know, I'm not sure if it's mist or fog or cloud or light emanating from the top. It's just light. Like it's yeah, just like that. Mountain. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't yeah. even yeah. a misty day. It's just like hazy it's back light. there. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, to me, in many ways, this is a complete scene. There's, there's really not a flaw that I can notice in this image. And I love your handling, as you always do, as I kind of talked about before, of um, those darker shadows. And even though it's super dark in the frame, there's enough contrast and enough uh, revelation of detail to really make it um, its own worthy part of the frame to take in and behold. But yeah, this is just an amazing image uh, compositionally, um, use of framing, use of depth, use of light. Um, showing off the contrast and tonal values in a way which is makes every square pixel the frame just sing and so um this to me is one of your magnum opuses i feel like this is one of your best images from my personal standpoint and from the moment i saw it, I was just like wow this is a stunner it's another one that i didn't know what i had when i first had it you know because it was like green we're shooting it I saw it, the tree. The tree on the upper left is way greener than the rest. So I shot it because of the shapes. I was actually with Mike Demiola. He was on our workshop, mm. and I hated it because of that green. I, so I wish that one. it was all like that, blue with yeah. the, pine, the dark pine green, like the very subtle green of a pine. But that one on and the you, upper left is a deciduous tree. So you couldn't mm. tweak that with like HSL sliders. You can't make, make a deciduous tree look like a pine, you know, like it's yeah. not going to be the same kind of green. It was too luminous. And like, even then, I don't love green that much. Like if you look through my portfolio, I hardly have any green. Um, I just feel like it is so ordinary that it kind of removes the element of mystery. Obviously, green is super prevalent in nature and uh, it's just my personal preference. But like it's what you'd expect. I'm though. not really drawn to it. And mm -hmm. yet I think the black and white just like adds that rather yeah. removes that layer of context that makes it more mysterious not like all black and whites automatically do that but in this, in so, this. Was, 
Was it the color which made you go towards monochromatic or was it the the contrast on the luminous values, the tonal well, values? I, I check a lot of things out in monochrome, but I feel like if the color is not detracting, then mm -hmm. I might stay in color. But, but I've been doing more black and white lately. I mean, partly inspired by Sarah. She's so good at it and I'm relatively new to it. But I just feel like because I'm all about simplifying down to the essential elements, sometimes color is an unnecessary complication. And like it really lets the composition shine and the light if it's about that, which mm -hmm. that's why I shot this. You know, I hated the green even when I saw it in the camera, but the framing was too good not to shoot it. The light like fading off on those trees. So yeah, that's why I went black and white and it just happened to work really well. That was going to be my first to question because you don't have a ton of black and white images in your portfolio. So I was going to ask like what made you want to convert it, but um, yeah, you well, more, that more in the last couple of years and I, like even some of the ones in my new release, like I tried in black and white and thought they were just about as good, but I didn't want to let go of color unless I you was. You don't want to make it black and white just for the sake of making it black and white. You want it to be unless better. that was the goal of the project. Like yeah, I might cool. eventually have like a collection of black and white, but I'm still so relatively new to it that I don't have enough, you know. Yeah, but I could stop. convert a lot of my stuff like that would lend itself well. It's not like you can just desaturate everything and you're there. It's like way more complicated than that. Yeah, the, the light was strong enough in this one that it made it fairly easy. And the greens mm -hmm. versus the blue backdrop, like everything was really nicely delineated. Because the, the back, you see how misty it is. Or hazy, like that was just blue. Mm -hmm. The wall back there, so... It seems like you working in black and white is such a natural extension of the fact that you're so good with light. So yes, you are very good with color and very good with light, but I think you see light in such a unique way that so a lot of your work would lend itself really nicely to black and white. Like th this is also an example of how I think a lot of people would walk by this scene and be like, like that light is, the, it's either too harsh or it's hitting like the fact that there are the little speckles just on the edges, like that if there's not enough here or the it's too harsh or it's too this or too direct or too that or whatever. And I think you are able to zoom in on those opportunities that so many other people pass by, which is I think one of the reasons that your work stands out overall. So I think all of that could lead you to having a very successful black and white portfolio. But then it's it really nice color. guys thanks <laughs> <laughs> thanks for just building me up i feel like eric's about to tear me down <laughs> uh, oh yeah i think that it makes sense because i'm so into composition and light primarily the color is a complication a lot of the time which is why i have so many like mono or dichromatic images where i've simplified the color beyond reality to like push all the blues together and all the warm stuff together and now it's just two colors and like I, I appreciate when photographers do like a multitude of colors really well. I feel like I, it is a natural extension that I'll probably explore a lot more going forward. It kind of sucks that most cameras monochrome mode is just a straight desaturate. That was one of the best things about Fuji is they had a digital like red filter, digital green filter. Mm. So you could make this look this way in the viewfinder instead of having to know what you're able to do later. You could actually see it while you're composing. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, because they have the film background, they have all these like film presets that worked really, really well for black and white. And now on Canon, it's just kind of gray. Mm -hmm. Like everything's a mid gray. So I don't want to shoot in black and white. I just have to think about it more. But Sarah is definitely a huge inspiration in that regard. I feel like you do so well with like, I feel like a lot of people either are really really um just doing kind of like a straight desaturation without a lot of thought put into it and it comes off really flat or they're like way overdoing it to the point where like it's all deep blacks and bright whites and i just feel like you bring the gentleness of the rest of your photography into your handling of black and white while going dramatic with it and like that balance that you strike has always been really inspiring to me so I definitely, I definitely think about you when I go black and white nowadays. Thank you, Alex. So this... uh, what's funny about this one is both Paul and Jimmy chose it, but Paul chose it first. So 
And I would. Jenny? It was. It was definitely among my, my. It's my, among my favorites of Alex's work. Did hey, you? Did you, you all need to back off. Time zones on that. <laughs> you all need to. Be, you all need to back off. All right. <laughs> I feel like I got it in before. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I saw this one, Alex. I was just like blown away. I mean, there's just. I mean, you, you look at it and. I mean, I know what it is. I mean, you can tell what it is, but it's like, what's the scale? A lot what of people exactly couldn't tell, it? but I, I know what the yellow some, liquid is. I think you, <laughs> I think you need some experience <laughs> in the canyons to really see it. At least for sure. I got so many questions about it. People still don't get it. Oh and man, it's cool it's... that you're able to know. But I mean, it's like I spent a tremendous amount of time in the canyons, and you don't just find this every day, like this pristine and well, like scalloped and. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Paul. I'm sorry. No, no, you're you're spot on though. But it's 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 beautiful. I really this is. I mean, your portfolio is absolutely mind blowing. But um, this is this is one of my all time favorites of yours. And um, when we when we when we called out we were going to have you on the show, I was pretty quick to get in there and pull this <laughs> baby, pull this bad boy out and throw it up because I knew these savages would be, like, <laughs> would be vultures <laughs> and want to get on us. I'm like, not happening guys. <laughs> so yeah, I really appreciate this one and uh, would love to hear your thoughts on it a little bit more. Is um, this one fucking money, Paul? I heard you say that once this episode. It's fucking money. <laughs> been quiet, man. I know that fourteen point seven put the grip on me early. <laughs> yeah. I finished that bottle, boys. <laughs> Girls, holy holy shit! Yeah, the I idea hope... that you were gonna have some later, like, no, you're finished. <laughs> don't, don't I, I, uh, I know. I pulled the cork, and I know yeah. you were just like, eh, I'm gonna put this in and save some for next week. Yeah, that didn't that didn't happen. It got better as it got warmed up a little bit. So, yeah. Talk to us about it, Alex. Um, well, it was, this is an exact, this is like a really nice case study, I guess, for why I approach things the way I do now with not having any expectations, because it's the kind of image you could never possibly predict. And it's like one of my absolute favorites and one of the most me. And I still haven't seen anything like it, even though people have seen it now for three years. Like, it's not like you can go out and find it because it's so particular to those conditions at the time and like my preferences on like the flow of composition and um, just removing elements that don't belong and kind of simplifying like I feel like it's the argument for why I should keep doing what I'm doing for myself like when I think about like what do I need to improve or try to do differently um this is like one of the times where I feel like it really, whatever, all the things that I feel are weaknesses in terms of like my tunnel vision for certain things, it, it happened to work really well in this instance. And, um, I just, I've also had images like this before where I go looking for it again, like trying to like, maybe I can find something else in that van you never do. Like it's, it's just, um, it was a spring flood in Zion. So the mud was freshly scalloped and it's just a nondescript slot. It's not like a really well-known one in a popular area of the park. It's not even named as far as I know. It's just a place where the canyon gets thinner and it has these walls that are um, apparently really good at scalloping mud and like the mimicked lines in the wall, mm -hmm. like the, exactly the water lines. How do you get there? What are the, uh... Do you recall the coordinates? And... Well, that's it's not that it's not that hard to get to. It's like on, it's everything that if someone had to have me defend why I don't think you need to work that hard physically for photography, like I just show them this photo and be like, if I had hiked ten miles down a slot, there's no guarantee I would have gotten anything like this. But it's like not all that far from a road, like it's not visible it's kind of tucked away which is kind of my favorite thing like it's really quiet and peaceful in there but it's not super hard to get to so i wasn't so tired from like hiking there that i wasn't ready to be creative you know like my mind was still at 100 um, percent yeah didn't expect anything just happened upon it 
Um, it was at the start of the pandemic. So we were avoiding people, but driving through Zion. And yeah, I'm really glad that I happened to like investigate it a little more because I remember walking by it initially and then thinking like, okay, we're going back to the car. We're going to continue on to Springdale. And I just like when I was walking back past it the other way, I was like, okay, I need to go back to the car and get my camera and like tell Taylor this is going to be a while because she wasn't into photography yet. So that was another thing <clears throat> where it was like now that she's really into it, like there's no question that we can spend as long as we need, like hunched over some photo for two hours and I don't feel like she's waiting on me. But at the time, it's like I had to be conscious of her time. Like we had plans for the day. So that was a constraint or I felt like it was, even though she would probably have been very cool with it taking as long as I right. needed to. How, how long do you feel like on average you spend with like any given composition while you're shooting in the field? Depends on how fast the light's moving. But on this, like I had as much time as I needed, I thought in terms yeah, of let's the say, let's say like, like a soft light scene where the lighting is pretty constant and patient. How long I do might, you think you would spend on average? I might be on one shot for like two hours, honestly. Really? Like I, it's not that it would take me that long to get there necessarily, but I, I iterate and, you know, try different variations. And then I really like treating my digital camera, like a film camera. Like have, I even have a geared head now that I don't shoot with a ball head anymore. I feel like <clears throat> very slow on a tripod is just my way. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I have to be faster for light, but um, I really like to refine. I really like the quiet process of like just tweaking every little bit. And like, I feel like time goes away. Like I don't yeah, think yeah. about how much time has passed. And that's why I say two hours can go by because it doesn't feel at all like two hours. Yeah, it definitely me. passes quicker than you realize. But right. I just like get in that flow state, I guess. And this is one such thing where I could just hunch over it for as long as my back would allow me to. Do you feel like a lot of times though, like even after spending a lot of time composing something, you end up using one of the first exposures? Sometimes it's either that or the last one. Yeah, because I'm not quite there. And that's why I've spent so much time. And then I finally get it. And then it's just like, okay, well, now it's, we're done. Like, that's all it was. Mm -hmm. It was about the positioning and the composition. Um, so yeah, earlier or later, it's not usually a middle exposure. I just ask because like, I wouldn't describe myself as like impatient, and I don't rush. But like when I photograph, like those of you that have shot with me, maybe you've noticed this, like, I feel like I'm very swift, like, I find something I set up, I play with it for a little bit and then I move on. Like, I just feel like I can decide pretty quickly whether it works or not. And also like when I first come upon a scene, the reason I even want to try photographing it is because I feel this like initial like fascination, like excitement for the subject and the scene. And then as I scrutinize it too much and like try to dial it in, that just kind of dissipates and I'm kind of like left with less emotion towards what I'm photographing. And so like, I kind of like to photograph with that still intact, like that initial like feeling before it just disappears because I've worked on it too long and it just like kind of, you know, I don't know, that just kind of fades away from me after maybe, like I would say on average, I probably spend like maybe 10 minutes photographing a scene. It's, I, I think that it's important to follow intuition because sometimes you can overthink it and then yeah. you'll never get like the initial right. kind of framing. And that's like, if you ever tried scouting with a phone and then getting your tripod into the right location to shoot that same thing, it's like, how the hell did I do this? I don't even remember because it was all intuitive. You weren't thinking about it. But um, I think in a scene like this, like what I think are my greatest flaws, like in general, are also what have allowed me to be a photographer. Like I'm pretty OCD and um, I will obsess over details for hours and hours, like be it with my fucking computer or processing a photo, but like I can also apply that to composition. And I think that if I'm still excited about it and it's not purely an analytical exercise at that point, then I really, really love that process and i think it benefits me to spend that much time i've photographed with alex a couple of times where he's stuck with something and i haven't 
And then I see his results and think, oh my gosh, I should have stuck with it. Like I can think of one time we were at the Eureka Dunes in Death Valley and we both saw a set of dunes that I think we both, the same set of dunes appealed to both of us. And we both photographed for a while and then I walked away, did my own thing and Alex stayed there for almost the entire, or a yeah, very you guys, extended period I was there most of the time and you guys went off and did all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and it's like, then I look at his photos and I'm like, oh, oh we both like <laughs> why did i walk away so that's it's, i think i stick with things longer i think than most people mm -hmm. but then being around alex it's like the time that he's spending that all that refining you can see it end up in the final photos like as being a benefit that's mm -hmm. it's like it doesn't have diminishing returns like it does for me i would say well it's like yeah, it depends on your style and how you're working and whether your like intuition is stronger than your analytical mind. And in terms of, I feel like my intuition sometimes is right, but only just in getting me the idea. And then I really need to think about it to come up with something like this. But um, I like, like I'm also a creature of comfort. So like I like going hard on one thing more than doing all the different things. So... Like, for example, I just posted about that. Um, I just wrote some nonsense caption on Instagram that was just like a stream of consciousness, but I posted about a Taylor Swift song that I was referencing. I've listened to that song like 50 times in the last few days. Like, <coughs> it's when I find something I like, I go hard on it. But like, that's usually like Taylor gets really fucking annoyed with it when I want to listen to the same song all the time. And um, like, I feel like I don't explore new avenues as much as I should. But when you focus all that OCD energy on one thing, like sometimes it works out really well. And I do that with my processing too. So I think that's like why I'm able to teach that for a living is because I've just spent so much time obsessing over it. Have you ever had the experience where you spend like a long time with something and then you walk five feet and find something else like, oh yeah. shit, I should have been shooting this <laughs> while the light was this way. Or like, you know, I totally missed yeah. out on this opportunity. I try to do now I'm more conscious of like I walk the scene at least and try like get different big picture reads first before focusing in on one thing for two hours because I have had mm -hmm. that happen and it's a terrible feeling especially when the light's gone yeah anyway I mean all of this is to say that like I I don't produce all that many photos and maybe you can see why now like the way that at least if you imagine the way that I am in the field. Like, obviously I don't get out there as much as I could either, but uh, <laughs> when I'm out there, it's like, I'm very kind of focused on singular things that grab my attention. And sometimes I don't come away with anything. And it's like, I feel like I wasted my time. And other times I have something like this that like, I'll love it forever. And that's, right. if you it was time well spent. Too you focus too much on the wrong thing, then that's like a problem with hyper focus. But if you can find the right thing to focus on, then is you there a benefit? I don't know much about ADHD, but isn't it ironically like you do focus on something too much while also it's simultaneously like being on it? Or like scattered? Like it's kind of like a bipolar way of focusing. Like you're either mm -hmm. hyper focused or I feel like I might it would explain a lot <laughs> i don't I haven't been <laughs> diagnosed or anything but um yeah thanks for picking good. this one out yeah, that was a really I, the detail that you just provided is great it really it was probably too much you're just like oh, i just wanted no, to tell me about color no it's you know it's <laughs> mud and water dude <laughs> no it's it's, hey, it's stone <laughs> too man it's, it's great dry mud <laughs> for millions of years <laughs> No, I, th I think that's the stuff that people want to hear because, I mean, you, you, you look at the photo and you appreciate it, but then there's a lot behind that of what goes into it to, you know, come upon a scene like that, put in the work, and then, you know, all the stuff uh, in between that you just uh, referenced, which was fantastic. Appreciate that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. A different kind of work, though, you know, like it's not that far from a road. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yep. I feel like over time, I just noticed that like a lot of times, like the first exposures that I would make of things that I found ended up being the best compositions and stuff. Cause it was just like this intuitive, like 
fluid um, response to what I saw. But a lot of times I would shoot it like handheld and I want to be super sharp or like, you know, like those quick snapshots when you're first yeah. getting set up. So then I was like, shit, I should just like make sure those first shots are like sound technically before I start exploring because a lot of times they ended up being the best. And I feel like at least with my brain, once I overthink something or like once my logical brain takes over, it I lose like the magic in the scenes. Like it just disappears. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've just learned to just trust my intuition way more and just once I'm not feeling it anymore, I just move on or once it feels right, I move on and I don't like continue to see if there are like other options or like other things like that. Cause, um, I also just like to like see as much as I can and have like a very full experience of the place and yeah, not get too caught up on one thing and miss out on everything else. But I mean, I think I'm, I miss out on that stuff by working the way that I do. Uh, I'm looking at my exposures now. This one was actually only like 20 minutes because I was on a bit of a schedule between the first and last exposure, and I only have 12 exposures. So I wasn't, I mean, what I was speaking about is more um, general, you know, wasn't this. Well, and I do tend to happened. spend a decent amount of time visualizing before I ever take the first exposure as well. So. I assume you were the same as with this one, like, yeah, was, I think my phone, because it was a little bit wider of an angle, I probably had the telephoto on and this was with the 24 to 105. I know, um, probably like 35 millimeters or so. Let me look. Hmm. Um, oh, it's 24 actually. So I probably needed my phone to like sketch out the composition. Yeah. Yeah. I tend to like compose with my eyes as much as I can before I even like set up the camera. I just can't see wider with my eyes, you know. I can see a telephoto <clears throat> composition without pulling it out. But I can't see the way the lines are gonna go in a wide angle. Yeah. I can't I'm not good at visualizing that. The way that someone like probably like Mark Adamus is like he can just look at a scene and be like, all right, fourteen millimeters, we're gonna use this line, it's gonna go like that. Like right. <laughs> I don't like it's, it's like, like surprising to me when I when I look at it at 24 millimeters. I'm like, whoa, mm -hmm. that's what that looks like. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's been like a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I I chose this one because I just like the rhythm of the scene has always struck me as being so notable. Like just the way the layers feel like they're moving. And then the addition of the the light on the mist and I just feel like everything comes together so beautifully in this one. It did feel a little strange choosing a photograph from the East Coast <laughs> for you. Yeah, no, I mean, but... it's one of my favorites. still. So it's like, it was worth the trip out there just for this one. <laughs> yeah, it's um, like the it. I think the rhythm, I think that's the bottom line for this one. I think it's just as simple as the fact that it feels like it has a lot of compositional rhythm. And that's something that I think is really hard to teach and really hard to, to help someone understand if they don't, like if they're not intuitively drawn to figuring out that kind of, like how can you get motion into a still photograph? Uh, and I think you do it really well. So I thought this was a nice representation of that. Um, it's also like the subtle colors in the trees. I also think make it like, again, you, you treated it gently, um, that the color you're really great with colors, but you're also like, in this case, you treated them, um, you, like you could have amped up the reds a lot, amped up the blues. Um, yeah. but I think the more subtle treatment works really nicely. So those were some of the things that like hallmarks of your work that I think play themselves out in this photograph really nicely. Something I was just thinking is like, when you look at this image overall, it feels blue. But then when you look at like individual areas, like you focus in on them, you're like, wait, where'd the blue go? Like it's, yeah. it becomes like very neutral. So I feel like you dialed that in really nicely. So it has that cool feeling, but it's not overly saturated beyond reality. I mean, that was just, I remember thinking about the white balance there, like waffling between a pure blue, white, like kind of super clinical, not clinical, but just clean look or like warmer because there was 
sunlight on the mist in this particular scene. It wasn't soft light. Like wanting just a hint of warmth, but not losing the blue. Good old white balance slider. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> I appreciate that, Sarah. Um, it's definitely my favorite from the East Coast. Well, the, it's kind of a, an equivalent, a, the tree equivalent of the dappled light photo, uh, the Badlands with all the dappled light on them. Like, I think it's a lot of the same. It's just a different scene, but a lot of the same ideas. So mist, the mist has light on it instead of Badlands having light on it. Yeah. So it's like a, it's lot a layer of the same shot, mm -hmm. but it has, yeah, kind of like the zigzag swooping motion, which I appreciated that you said, because I was just said, like with David Ward's photos that I wish that I had more motion because I feel like a lot of my compositions are really rigid, kind of like flat in terms of the, the plane of the subject and the lines stuff. Like I'm, I'm always really happy if I can find motion, which the last two photos we've shown, I guess, have that. But that's kind of a rarity for me. Yeah. The red, I feel like, looked weird if I pushed it. So maybe that's why I didn't. But I feel like it was more about the mist anyway. No, it would just distract. It'd be weird without light like direct light on all those shaded reds for it to be super bright mm -hmm. and you have kind of like softly lit fog and the trees are more like silhouetted too yeah they're darker so if you brighten them up to the point where it would look right with like they're being lit then you lose the silhouette nature against the light fog i mean it's pretty straight basically that's what it comes down to like i didn't do a whole lot to it i this think there was one, for one little tree. landscape boards no there's one little <laughs> tree in the top middle that was like really small but really distracting that i left in initially that brent clark uh convinced me to clone out and i'm glad i did <laughs> because it was just taking away from like the form of the rest of the scene it was too distracting so i'd leave that in if i had to go nlpa with it <laughs> hopefully it'd still be okay do they let judges enter previous judges I don't think right they have a, any formal rule. I feel like the judges would know and they'd be like, nah, this is going to look bad. You know, <laughs> like, like, because they're very conscious of like things being a conflict of interest or, or yeah. like unf unfair. So they wouldn't want that appearance. So I, I wouldn't, know, even, I I wouldn't thought, even, I wouldn't even try, but I never thought I'd be eligible for another award. Yeah. You got the intimate of the year this year. Something like that. I think the judging is different though, because like we have a little bit of a behind the scenes knowledge about like how, how the decision-making process goes and how to make something stand out at every step of the way. Cause I have so many photos that are unprocessed that like, I would be curious to see, like nobody would know that they were mine. I'd be I curious to see how my work would do. Yeah. I, I, just don't think I would they never would. do it. I don't think they would discriminate against you guys because since they're rotating judges out so much, like if they were doing that, then they'd be like getting rid of like so many great potential mm -hmm. participants in future years. Like, right. well, I don't, I don't think they would discriminate. I guess I'd leave the tree in then, you know, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. NLPA. Here we go. 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it back. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I really like that you picked this one because I feel like, nobody thinks about it including myself i forget that i have it you know it's not like i don't it doesn't fit in with all my dune stuff and the things people might be familiar with it's not like a signature alex Mariaga photo but it has a signature qualities in it yeah i think if i shot more of this stuff i think it would still be top shelf like in terms of those photos of mine i don't think that i could do better with this subject, which is why I like it so much. It feels like, oh, that's what I wanted when I went out there. Like that, I didn't have that in mind, but I just, like everything comes together. That was that was fast moving fog and light. Like I'm really happy I was where I was. Mm -hmm. But Shenandoah is really nice because you can drive up and down the road and have access to a lot of different viewpoints as conditions change. And like it was clearing this day and I was kind of chasing around the clearings. And then I remember I like stayed on this a while as I do, but the light, as soon as it was gone from the mist, it was pretty flat. Hmm. So then it felt a lot more like every other like foggy tree layer shot I'd seen once it was all 
lightless. <laughs> it's a beauty. Thank you. So there are a ton of images in your portfolio that I love, Alex, and I think you know it. Um, but when I saw that nobody had chosen an aerial image, it made me want to choose one of these because I think one of the coolest things that uh, there's just like certain images or like gallery releases that just kind of become iconic that like nobody ever forgets about. And I just think it was like the coolest thing ever when you released like some of the first, and I know you weren't the first person, uh, like Laurent Martrez had photographed this stuff from like an airplane and stuff. You, you pointed that out to me um, and probably some other people that you'll mention, but um, I feel like you were the person that kind of, I don't know, you released a set of images that was just so insane and just like blew everybody away um, of this area. And it just felt like a really unique idea and everything. And then it just totally took off. Like it became like such a trend and like people were just chasing these images. And I mean, it made me want to get a drone. And uh, I've also photographed some of this area as well because I just couldn't help it. Like it just seemed like such a cool way to explore these geological formations and everything. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to bring this up because I think that's like just one of the coolest things that you've done um and that any photographer has done in like the last 10 years it's just like such an iconic body of work like i don't think anybody will forget these like six or eight or whatever amount of images it was in this set with like mother brain and uh yeah the other ones that were mm -hmm. super cool everyone's nodding their head but um absolutely yeah man i don't know i just thought it'd be cool to talk about this because that was such a cool like uh yeah just kind of like an iconic thing and uh just kind of an unforgettable moment that I think will go down in recent like landscape photography history, honestly. Well, that's nice. <laughs> just say, uh, I, yeah, I really. It's, it's so not what he said last night again. Like... Well, he's putting on a show right now. He just wants to be affable for the camera. But... <laughs> he's the most disagreeable guy I know behind the scenes. I, I appreciate that. I. I get why people like get protective of their locations and stuff because I felt that way initially with this sort of thing. Like when people started copying it, like, Hey, that's my thing. Like, stop it. <laughs> but then I thought about how, like I had initially seen an aerial of the blue badlands from Laurent Martres in one of his books, which was from a plane, like you said. And, um, it's like, yeah, it wasn't really my idea. I just like, had more execution because it. the drone allows you all that freedom and you don't have to book a flight or just happen to be passing over. Um, but I, I only did like two, like 2016 and 2017, like two small releases of drone stuff because I started feeling very disconnected from the work. Like this doesn't really do anything for me unless I look really closely at the light, like the overall layout I'm, proud of finding i suppose but i you know just you're playing a game when you're doing a drone you know it's like, yeah, playing it's like a, video a video game. game it's not like being in the landscape like the really quiet thing that i really like about it like just kind of being with the trees and being in the viewfinder it's totally different it's all rushed and hectic with the 20 minute battery life 25 maybe and plus the flight time to get there and the time to compose and you got to get back and i almost lost my drone so many times it's like in this maze of washes, not this one, it'd be easy to find here, but just spending too long composing and then, oh, the battery's dying. Now I need to fly back and it starts, yeah. it starts landing it's beeping on its and own. It's and so noisy. like it's up here and it'll start landing wherever it is because the battery is going to die and it doesn't want to fall. So you have to start controlling it as it's landing. It's like, will I clear this ridge and get back to where I'm at? <laughs> I almost didn't. Like I was so close one time where it would have just been like out in the wilderness and I would have had to hike where there's no trail, like in this fucking maze to try to find it. God forbid Alex has to go hiking. No, it's that you could really get lost out there. You know, <laughs> Like some of the stuff uh, northeast of here, like it gets crazy out there, man. The terrain. It's mm -hmm. not that I wouldn't hike to get it. Like it had only been like a mile. Um, but anyway, it's, and actually I, what is that place? I don't want to say the name actually, but you know, David Thompson shot it a lot. Like the, uh, 
the hoodoos in New Mexico, not yeah. Bistai, which is really well known, but there's a different one um, that I won't blow up that I went out there by myself one time and it got dark and I, it's like the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Like I, in terms of landscape, got lost as fuck. yeah, I was lost as fuck and it was dark and I didn't have like Gaia on my phone or anything. And it was just this maze of washes. Like it was so scary. I eventually found my way back obviously, but really, really easy to, for that to happen in the desert when you have, well, anywhere in the desert, but especially, you know, these ups and downs of the landscape where you can't see where the hell you're going. And at night, so it's not that crazy. It's not that I wouldn't want to hike. So I don't want to die. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a damn yeah. I, I feel so disconnected from it. You know, like I like yeah. I like the light and the textures down there. If I had been on this mesa, which we've both been up um, and shot down with my camera, I would feel a lot more connected to it. But instead, I was near my car. I get sunrise. Like I just woke up and like rolled out of bed and set up the drone and. Like, I just don't feel like I was in it. Mm -hmm. So I, totally I appreciate understand the you. photos. But now I if I did it, my drone. I think I, yeah. Yeah, I haven't used my drone in over two years just because I just don't enjoy the experience and I feel like it's very annoying and stuff. And It's loud, and I too. I don't want, I don't want to case. annoy people. Like, I don't want yeah. to be the guy with the drone, so I would have to be sure no one's around. And, like, this is a Super very obnoxious. desolate area, but there can still be people. But if I did it yeah. now, I don't think I'd be going for like the big scene like this. I'd be like down on one of these sections, you know, like a lot closer, just trying to get a perspective that you can't get on foot, even with a really tall tripod. Yeah, so, but this scene does warrant like that wider angle. Like this is so perfect how everything is just like all these veins are converging. Like, yeah, it's this one's insane for sure. The initial sure. one didn't have light like this. This is the later one. So yeah, the first release had the gray like version and then I went back a year later because it was so flat. Like I had found the composition, but not the conditions. Mm. And then, yeah, at sunrise, it just glows like this. Like it looks like maybe I processed the wash as bluer, but that's just light versus no light. And then white when balance. it's in the shade, it gets really cool. Yeah. I didn't really do much. <clears throat> Especially so. juxtaposing against the warm light. Yeah, Alex, I just wanted if, to go, Sarah. Um, Alex, if you do end up in Iceland in uh, this year, do you think you have any interest in air, doing aerials there? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I feel like it's a really great way to come up with photos that are really compelling. I also feel I like recommend it's it. a little... Like it's, it's like, I need to get out of my own head about it because I feel like it's a little cheap. It's like really easy to get a really, not to get a perfect composition, but to get a really novel perspective. And then you're already playing with fire or like you're already cooking, you know, you don't really have to do <laughs> as much as you would on the ground to find a photograph. So it's mm -hmm. less gratifying and easier, but it's also kind of like, like inherently hectic. shocking because it's just so different from what we can see with our eyes. Yeah. But I mean, Iceland, I, it's probably an opportunity I shouldn't turn down, you know, bringing a drone mm -hmm. to a place like that. And I might get one again for a place for this area at some point. But I would really yeah. want to do a project if I were to do that. Last time I went to Iceland in like 2018, I think it was like, I just shot the most incredible collection of aerial photos like you've never seen before, like the best photographs ever, ever, ever in the history of landscape photography. And then I crashed the drone and lost them all because I was being a dummy. Oh, shit. Just one SD the world card. will never know. There's no proof yeah. that it ever happened. I swear, they were just, it's like the Tenacious D song, you know? This is not the greatest photo in the world. It's just a tribute. Only a tribute, yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is this photo doesn't actually look anything like that photo. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a tribute. Exactly. I've been listening to a lot of Tenacious D lately, actually. <laughs> the original album. Nice. Jack Black's awesome. He is. And he's a sweetheart, apparently. He's like one of the last celebrities that is a really good guy that we know of anyway. Mm. <laughs> you know, everyone gets found out. They're all assholes. But then there's like Keanu and Jack. Yeah. That's what this show should be about. Celeb gossip. Every Epstein's <laughs> <island>. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> It'd be five minutes long instead of more than three hours. Yeah, yeah that's about shit. all I know. I know Jack Black's <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> he plays video games too, a big gamer. Oh, yeah. He did a thing with Conan, I think. Where he was like, I saw him do a thing with uh, Tony Hawk, like for the new Tony Hawk Pro Skater game. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, Maybe I appreciated your kind of intro. Thing. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Give these dummies a chance to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to dominate here. But it's also okay if you don't have anything to say because <laughs> I would understand. I love the shot. I mean it's 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 a it's a great perspective of that area. Um I've flown a drone around this area before myself and uh nothing even close to this, but uh Paul came for it, sloppy seconds. I totally <laughs> did. I, I I love this the way uh, you lined it up against those buttes and how the veins just kind of come down and converge into the middle there. And you've got the nice light on there. Uh, really well composed. I feel like at this point, I'm just like with Eric prompting you and me sitting here. I feel like it's like, all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Th thanks, bro. <laughs> Say something nice about me. Yes. Like, just like, I feel strange, like, waiting for it, you know? You don't have to yes. say it. <laughs> Absolutely. Again. Come on, man. What are you going to say? <laughs> say something. That's cool. Um, how did you feel about all the people that were, like, coming out here and, like, chasing your compositions well, and, like, blatantly it, comp stomping you and not giving you credit or anything? Initially, protective but if you look at my portfolio from 2017 onward like it has become increasingly more anonymous and i think that was yeah. part of that catalyst is like i shouldn't have to feel protective because the reason people can find it is because you can look on google earth and it's like is it really mine then i just was there first if it's that obvious it's not or... like yeah i mean and like i think i did a good job composing them and i've seen some that are like not as well considered i guess but it's still like the same feature and approximately the same thing. Like it still has the wow factor and I'm just like, that's not terribly interesting to me if someone else can do it. Not because I have to be better, but just cause I want to be me. Right. Like it's not about the fact that I think I can do it better. I just want it. I think I can be me better and this isn't a good way for me to be me. I feel the same way. Like if I photograph something and somebody else is able to copy it, then it's kind of like my fault in a way, you know, like I just wasn't original enough or. Yeah. I mean, there are yeah. certain shots. I think that like the scene doesn't look anything like, like a black and white or like just the way that you handle the light or just like the composition is so not something that pops out at you that like, right. It feels really gratifying to make it. And it feels like nobody else would just stumble upon it in the same way they would like a more straightforward scene. So those are kind of my more favorite photographs like the, well, like the last four images that we've looked at, it'd be like virtually impossible for somebody else to find that exact spot and shoot them with the same everything, you know, like it'd be impossible to replicate them exactly as they are Yeah, for a number of reasons. Yeah. So that's, that's more valuable to me and I want yeah. to do more things that are me, but I see within this scene, like if a drone just had a telephoto lens, I see all sorts of things that I could do that other people wouldn't see. It's more like drones are a wide angle, so they're inherently kind of the whole scene in front of you. And like you can abstract, but you have to get really high up for that. And you mm -hmm. you have to have a landscape like capable of that. But otherwise it's just kind of like a really tall tripod, you know, on a wide angle. <laughs> so it's not it's not as easy to pick something out that is you're doing so much as it is just like getting to a place with the drone and mm -hmm. being the first person to be at that perspective right drones they need to have telephotos apparently there's like those commercial drones that can like fly with actual cameras you know like ten thousand dollars and they can carry a real camera yeah, have you seen those things i haven't those seen monsters. one in person <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like... I've been on back when I was doing filmmaking, I was on some sets where they had like a red camera on a drone like that and stuff. And they're pretty crazy. They're huge. The propellers would like fuck you up if it hit you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cut off a lens. Yeah. So peaceful, yeah, you know, landscape photography, quiet pursuit, <laughs> just like a fucking helicopter <laughs> taking off with your 
your camera on it. Anyway. <laughs> What are uh, what are some of your pet peeves, Alex? I feel like you probably have some like photography pet peeves. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> what do you mean? I don't just like uh, things in photography that people do that like bugs other people. The shit out of you. Yeah, or yeah. I don't know. I can't. I'd have to think you know, about just, it. Okay. What about I'm like uh, about just just like with gear or something or like about things about like. Uh, <laughs> Are you trying to get me to say a certain thing? It feels like you're leading me down a path. <laughs> and no, you have no, an I idea of where I'm going. To me. <laughs> I just feel like you're... Oh, yeah. I feel like Alex is very, like, meticulous and, like, very, like, hyper-focused, like you said, on certain things. And so, like, <clears throat> okay, I don't know, I'll you, you just get, like, really detailed with shit. Something with gear is that, like, Canon came out with this 200 to 800 millimeter lens, or they are coming out with it. And I saw all sorts of people online saying, I have a 150 to 600 like this is garbage it's too expensive like why do i need this i'm like so mad that they don't understand that there is a difference between 600 and 800 in terms of composing an image in camera they're like oh you can just crap it's like oh so you can just not nail your composition in the field is what you're saying you can just point at a place and then figure it out later on the computer like i don't like the idea that that, oh, just because you can crop something out of a high megapixel image that you shouldn't spend the time to get a composition in field. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the same if you just know it's somewhere within that frame and then you do it on the computer versus like seeing the edges of the frame and the perfect right. balance and the flow in the camera. Like that's yeah, like the most gratifying thing to me. And the idea that it's just the same thing just really pisses me off. It's like, it's not, you just don't care about composition. That's what you're telling me. If you think that it's the same to just crop right. later. But you do crop in like you'll you'll shoot in crop sensor mode or something like that or Yeah, I'll use crop mode to try to nail it in camera. Or like I'll crop later if it's just better for the comp, but I, I'm trying to do it in camera. Right. And then along those lines, it really fucking bugs me when camera makers put shit in the way of your composition. It's like the designers don't even care about composition. This is what you were trying to lead me to, maybe. <laughs> I just cannot believe that they would make a camera like Nikon Z7 <laughs> Mark I. You cannot turn everything off on the LCD. There is shit all over your composition. Oh, yeah. At the edges. <laughs> I see what you mean now. All the edges. On the display. Yeah. It's like, yeah, on the LCD, like there's shit all along the edges. You have to take the photo and play it back to see it clean. I hate that. So you can't even do it in real time. It's like this trial and error bullshit. I don't even like then, to use like the leveling thing, like the overlay anymore, because like no. sometimes I'm like, what is that like dark thing? And I think it's like a dark branch or something, you know, or like I'm like composing around. I'm like, wait, that's not even fucking there. Like I have the Canon set up in a very simple way. They let you com customize your screens where there's one screen with nothing on it and one screen with everything on it. So it's just one button press to flip mm. between all the info and nothing in the way. And there's still one thing that really pisses me off on Canon that I don't think I should get into because it's just, why would anyone care? Why would anyone want to watch this? Because you'll three, never be three you'll and never a half hours. an explorer of light if you say it. I already turned down, like, <laughs> not being an explorer of light, but working with Canon because I don't want to have to worry about stuff like that. I don't want to, like, not be able to say that it's fucking bullshit that their designers <laughs> don't think about their cameras as <laughs> machines to compose photographs. They're like machines to point in a general direction. And that's actually not true because Canon has really good ability to get a clean screen. But some cameras, like the number one thing I say with students when they ask me for shit, like for critique on their compositions, <laughs> for, shit. for shit, when they ask me for critique on their compositions in the field is like, can we get all the shit out of the way? Like, can I see your composition first? You can't even see it. Yeah. So how can we compose an image together? How can we figure out how to make this better? Because it's like, oh, we're shooting JPEG large. Like, oh, that's really nice information. Or we're shooting raw and it says the aspect ratio and it says what AF mode you're in. And it says your ISO and all that shit on top of your fucking photo. Yeah. I could go on about this. Like, it is so obnoxious that that is not the number one consideration and that everything gets out of the way so you can actually use your camera for what it's for. I think one it's of my rant. biggest pet peeves, and I already mentioned this in another episode, is like when you're shooting and somebody, like another photographer, just comes up and like fucking plops their shit down like right <laughs> next to you and they're just like, okay, I'm shooting this with you. Or, or they'll come up and be like, what are we shooting, man? Like, I'm like, Dude, we're not <laughs> shooting <God>. anything. <laughs> <laughs> we... <laughs> or like when when someone shows you a composition they got and then you go back to try to copy it, like you have to, 
You'd have to have Hickers, hate those guys. Just incredible balls to do something like that. Like the the just, nerve. Number one, how dare you? Like the, rookie move. The Kelly Kapoor thing from the office. I have one qu I have four questions. Number one, how dare you? <laughs> I think when somebody just rolls up and starts flying their drone around too, it's yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. That's yeah. a buzzkill. Oh, and then you tell them about it and they're like, Oh, I didn't know, and they keep doing it. It's like <laughs> They might argue with you or they might put their tail between their legs. They might say yeah. you're not a ranger. Oh, I don't mean when it's not allowed. I just mean like anywhere. It's just, I think it's oh, but like that's very. What, yeah. That's what I say to him, but I, I just, I think it's fucking annoying. But I also say yeah. you could get a ticket. But really what I mean is fucking stop it. Just stop it. Okay. <laughs> There's people yeah. around. Stop it. <laughs> so this is one of the images you guys were talking about earlier because you and uh, Michael were together, Michael Bellino for this mm -hmm. one. And he has another one. I mean, he has his own version of the same scene in his portfolio. Mm -hmm. So let's let's decide right now who's is better. Let's, let's well, Belino, was, Belino was saying earlier he's that he knows this is coming up on the uh, show, but uh, he no. he stands That's by. That's why he wanted to better. be here. Yeah, he wanted to uh, beef his up a little bit. I get it. So let's wanted to settle this dispute. Oh. Just put them up against each other and let them let them fight out amongst themselves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to me, it's the shadows for sure on those foreground trees, left and right. That's the decider. And I think I took like an initial version where the spacing was tighter, but then I have a frame which is a little more looser, like this one is more left to right. But the shadows are just like um, the light better, better you, for yours. You don't look at the shot and think about light, but it was really important. Like the, yeah. I think the mountains yeah. look better with the light in the background. Yeah. So I want to let Jimmy talk about this. When one. I process, yeah, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I don't want to talk about Michael. my stuff. Yeah. No, just like in terms of like, you know, this is more like late morning. Um, I just want to bring you process just some very simple contrast or levels adjustments. Um, really just made those layers and those mounds really um, graphically just kind of appear. I think I texted you, Alex, about that, like how simple it was just to make this scene um, really and post just kind of like really come alive for sure. I look at it now and I feel like the blacks are pretty black for a snowy scene. I'd probably do that differently. Uh, in the pine trees? The trees. Everywhere else yeah. is super soft. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, I, don't know. I think it's fine because it really delineates the trees, but maybe just a little harsh for such a soft scene. It doesn't look off at all. Anyway, it, I didn't. Jimmy, you're muted, no, but by the way. What? What I was going to say uh, before I let Jimmy go, because he chose this one and I want to hear why he chose it. Um, I feel like the main challenge of this one compositionally would be the spacing between the trees and that little one poking up in the background, the farthest tree. Like, There's not a square having to get version. too close or overlap. There's a square version with better spacing, but it couldn't. So the, the tree next closest to it is further to the left. Yeah, I stepped to the right, so there was more space between the middle and back tree, but I ended up... Because it almost feels like a continuous line. But I mean, I feel like it works here, but I'm saying like if yeah, you had I been... prefer the horizontal now just because it feels more complete, but the square yeah. one resolved mm -hmm. that. Like I just cut off that tree on the left and stepped to the right. So that's also... Oh, that's right. not on my website, but I, I have it. It's the one that was in international, so it's still on the internet some places. Yeah, yeah. I remember you having two versions, but yeah, I feel like you could totally fuck this one up if you were like a foot to the left and then the <laughs> trees are like on top of each other. I don't know. Lino I feel like smiling. that's like the deciding factor. Because he was standing to my left, if I recall. <laughs> <laughs> fuck it, fuck it, Molino. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I fucked it up. I need to go look at Bolinos now. Jimmy, uh, we'll let you out of the Look up right now. Well, I, I, I would say I, I chose this one because I couldn't get the Nautilus one in, um, even adjusted for the uh, time zone difference. Uh, <laughs> uh, what the hell? We're working off Greenwich Mean Time here. <laughs> uh, whatever. Um, but I don't know, there's a few images, Alex, that like uh, you know, looking at your portfolio that just stand out in my mind as like as I just kind of like they stick with me and this is definitely one of them and, um i just that that pillowy snow yeah oh yeah for sure and um 
Uh, but the the pillowy snow and just you just captured the moment so 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 nicely. Um, it's just uh, when we get uh, around here when we get the snow like this, it's just it doesn't not last long. So you just you uh, you kind of have to jump on it because it just gets pounded by all the other trees and it you know you get little holes in the snow and all that so it gets crowded yeah out. for it to be this clean that's crazy right like you look at big snowy scenes and like once it starts falling <laughs> off the trees like you said mm -hmm. it gets a lot messier it, it, and and within an hour like after the sun starts hitting it it it, it starts or, or wind you know and it, yeah it's just it's very rare um you know around here but uh yeah, you got that that thick East Coast snow. Is it different consistency, like kind of heavy and uh, wet? Yeah, but it's more so. It's just like there's so many trees around that you know when it mm. comes off the branches, it it puts holes and with the landscape. They're very twiggy too. Like these are pretty hardy trees. Yeah, you know, but like a lot of the East Coast trees, I imagine might lose a branch with the snow, and then the branch right. becomes a complication or a photo. Right, right, and then and then they they also. Um, what I see when I look at scenes like this is like the, they start to take on these human figures, um, you know, and then so there's, you know, what are they, you know, what's the posture of the human saying here, you know, is it the body language of the trees and, you know, so there's all kinds of stories that this evokes, but it just, you know, this one is one that's definitely always been with me. So, um, even though I couldn't get the Nautilus one in. But that's mm -hmm. Well, you still picked a favorite of mine, and I really appreciate that you appreciate those things about it, because I kind of took them for granted, being that that's just how it was. I didn't really think about, like, why I haven't seen anything like this, but it makes sense that the, the snow being that clean is kind of rare in the first place. I think if you're going to anthropomorphize? Yeah. Uh -huh. anthropomorphize. Anthropomor anthropomorphize this then I'm probably the second one from the left, like with the terrible posture. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of camera bag has he got there? Man? <laughs> <laughs> it's a Jan sport, man. It's just got all those gear jangling around in one pocket, like with his school books from high school. <laughs> yeah. No ICUs. <laughs> But you know, and the and the center one is so proud and tall and and standing firm and you know. I didn't even think about. It. I feel like I just saw it for the shapes and like, I like trees in general because they have character. Yeah. But I didn't think about the center one being such like an anchor ever before in terms of how strong it stands. That's cool. Yeah, and the like <laughs> secondary pattern here, like the background of like all the soft like snow dunes, is pretty remarkable as well because that's all mm -hmm. very cohesive and like well organized. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's always what it's been about for me. And like the trees are clearly the subject if you look at the photo, but I wouldn't love it if it wasn't for that background. Like the fact that that could go on and on, mm -hmm. right? Just like this very clean infinity back there because the hill starts arching up. It's like kind of in a bowl. We're pointing down into a depression, like a valley. Mm -hmm. These are like just the Bolinos. tips of the trees. They're really tall. Yeah, they, yeah these are just in... the tips that are exposed, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's at least I think it might have been 13 feet of snowpack. That's actually, crazy. it was so much. That's yeah. crazy. I've been wow. by this scene like many, many times since, and I still can't pick out which individual trees. We're actually yeah, no, featured they only look images. this way because of there's, the tips. There's no way. There's a bunch of other trees no just way. completely buried that were shorter. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's amazing. It's pretty dense. It's pretty dense. It's not just these islands of trees. It's like this whole, like, you know, these many more trees than what is seen in this image buried beneath the snow. Almost a forest down there, really. It was yeah. like the, the stream running through it all. Yeah, I've always so felt I pretty like... much know exactly where we stood as we walk down this section of trail and the perspective is right something there, too. I have no idea. the fact that we were 13 15 feet higher than the road or trail yeah, or whatever is there like if right. you go without that then now you're just kind of looking straight into the trees instead of from above them so that's another reason you'll probably never see the spacing or like you'll never recognize them because you're just looking at them from the side instead yeah ever since i first saw this one i've always felt like it's so surreal 
very peaceful scene. Yeah. It almost looks I like think... a video game or something. Mm-hmm. It's another good example of how photographers sometimes think of like epic light as being color that's happening in the sky. And instead of thinking about how is the light interacting with the landscape and the subjects. And this is a great example of how it's it's soft, subtle light, but it's very special light and it really highlights the 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 curves and then the edges of the snow so that it adds dimensionality to the scene. And that that makes it just as epic as like a super colorful sunrise or sunset. So like that, the subtlety of the light actually complements the scene so well. And that having more open mindedness about what good light is means yeah. that you're open to seeing things like this. But let's be clear, yeah. there is such a thing as bad light. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I think I think the misconception is that like there is one certain kind of light that is good light and everything else is like inferior but really it's just like about the given scene like what is the complementary light for that yeah. particular scene it's always going to be different according mm -hmm. to the subject matter or well yeah not just for the scene but i just love that that it's not it doesn't look like every other photo because it's not pink you know like mm -hmm. that the red thing like sunset sunrise like it also make it's such a strong color that it makes all those photos look the same to me now yeah. it's like unless there's a really special composition i'm almost like desensitized to red and pink to the point where when i'm scrolling through instagram it's like i don't care how awesome of a sunrise or sunset it was like i am past that photo without even thinking about stopping because it looks like every <laughs> other one because it's so strong like it just kind of overrides everything in the photo you know yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So like I have a lot of red in my portfolio, but it's more like the sandstone and stuff. And I've tried to stay away from that light, even though it's like amazing to behold in person. I just feel like it makes photos look the same. And maybe that's just social media era, you know, gotten I've seen too much of it now. Mm -hmm. Then then I value things that are like less conventional or more subtle just because it's rarer to see out there. Yeah. Yeah, this one almost looks like you converted it to monochrome. And I've done that and it loses a lot. Like there's a lot of subtlety in the blue to white. You would think that it would be very similar, but and and it would work in black and white, but the color is just like another dimension to separate. It just adds like another little touch of contrast because that light is so soft that it just gives you a little bit more separation. So yeah, I didn't I didn't know what we had. You said you looked at Bellinos. Oh yeah, there's no comparison. His fucking sucks is worth it. Oh, I'm sorry for bringing it up. <laughs> fucking Bolino, oh. you son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Alex. Something that I feel is remarkable about your portfolio is like, especially nowadays, with social media being like the most prominent way that we all share our images. Like, I feel like images just come and go so quickly and so few of them are remembered. And that's part of why we're doing this show so that a lot of the great stuff can get some more airtime and a bit more attention than it does on social media. But um, I feel like you've just managed to make so many memorable, like iconic images that are just like seared in so many of our brains. I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like it's across the board. Like, uh, yeah, you're you it's it's pretty rare to like make an iconic photo these days and somehow I feel like you do it time and time again. That's nice. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, I think that it might be a product of my like obsessive curation. Like I'm so I'm trying so hard not to show you anything that is ordinary, you know, that maybe to my detriment because I'm losing a lot of photos that are nice. But... Well, what I will say them. though, like, but I want you to remember caveat. those. Like, you do have a lot of iconic stuff, but I do like that maybe you've been like a little bit looser or maybe more prolific now, because there's lots of other stuff that's not iconic, but it's great. Like, I'm super happy to see it, and I'm glad you share it because not every image needs to be iconic either. But it just yeah. seems like you know, so few images become iconic nowadays. Um, like I'm not trying to out, make you know. anything iconic. It's just like, right. But I do want you focused on things that I'm most proud of. So like, 
that's where that comes from. It's like, if I think about someone going to my website and looking at things I'm not too hot on, it's like, why are they even there? Yeah. Like, why did I give them that distraction? Mm -hmm. So that might be why. I mean, I just don't have that many photos, relatively speaking. Like, do right. like 30, 30 or 40 a year, 50 maybe on a big year. Yeah, so you kind of generate less noise just within your own portfolio to begin with. There's it's less a stuff to sit conscious through. choice and one I'm trying to like be a little more loose on because there's a lot of stuff that gets left behind with that approach. Yeah. But, but like you said, not every photo can be that memorable. So, How do you rationalize like the time that you spend the days that you spend where you don't end up with photos? Like, how do you achieve a level of comfort with that? Oh, it's, I didn't have comfort at the start. That's why I was like, that's why I was at Rainier that day because I felt like I need to be out every day. I also didn't have a girlfriend at the time. I didn't have, I didn't live with friends. I didn't live with friends even. <laughs> like I was just kind of like a bachelor with self-employed. I had just all the time in the world in my hands. So that was kind of what I dedicated myself to. Um, and I don't really have photos to show for it because I don't think I was a good photographer at the time, but I just spent so much time trying to make things because I felt this need and now I don't feel the need. So a day where I don't make anything is fine because like, I, I feel bad if I miss a day that I know is really good and I should have gone out and taken advantage of like incredible conditions where I probably would have made like one of my favorite photos or at least the potential would have been there. But because I have such a portfolio now, like just I have years worth of photos that I like, I don't feel like I need to prove myself to myself. Like I don't need to um, show anyone. Like I feel like I, I have photos that I, that say what I want them to say on my website already and anyone can go look at it. Like now I'm more driven, like I need to make a book so that there's something tangible to make of all my work because prints are so few and far between. Yeah, I think but, um, and, like naturally yeah. most of us arrive to a point where it's like we're no longer eager to add stuff to our portfolios. Our portfolios are already too big as they are. So it's more of like replacing stuff in our portfolio rather than like accumulating more after like yeah, 10 don't, years or so. I don't need to make it bigger. I just mm -hmm. need to find new things and increase the library of ones that I'm really proud of. Cause like my favorites gallery is maybe like 30 something photos and I have like 400 something on my website. So, you know, maybe a 10th of the photos that I even thought were good enough to show everybody are ones that I really love. And then, so that's why I have the favorites gallery. Cause I want to have a place where anyone can look at the stuff I want them to be looking at the most, but also, um, yeah, it's just like kind of resting on my own laurels, I guess, but also just not feeling that that kind of drive. And the drive is more like a self challenge at this point. Like, can I come up with something new that surprises me or like really satisfying to make rather than like, oh my God, I need to get a shot of this and that so that I have it to show. Like, there's none of that anymore. So I don't really care to answer your question. It's a really roundabout way. <laughs> if I don't like get something on a day because I just have the comfort of everything I've done before. Yeah. And yeah, and when I look through that, that, when I look through it, it's not like I don't ever want to do anything again. It's just when I look at it, like when I look at my favorite photos, it reminds me that I can do this and it remind it kind of motivates me right. to make more. It's like a self reinforcing motivation at this point. Cause then I see like, Oh yeah, that was really satisfying to make. I can't believe I did that. Like I forget that I made this photo, like the one from the East coast. I always forget about that one. I'm like, Oh, that's a really nice photo. Like <laughs> I can do that. I forget. So yeah, that's all I need now. It's just to keep challenging myself to get better or do new things or do the same thing forever on different subjects, which is kind of a new thing. Thanks guys. You guys, too kind. I feel like I didn't get ribbed you. enough. Yeah, I really, I expected more. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little disappointed <laughs> in the level <laughs> of ribbing. I feel like like the photos were slightly unflattering, but there wasn't really any. I mean, 
I feel like there hasn't been enough goofing. It's been too serious. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, he's going to do it live. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yes. Where did that go? <laughs> nice work. Perfect. Well played. Has that week. been like your You've signature? You've got like an additional one down here too. Yeah, I mean, I weighed more then, so maybe I had the ability, but I'm also out of practice because that hurt my neck, honestly. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I might be too old for this shit. <laughs> Has you that been like your it, signature? Like, stretches to prepare. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my blue steel, Eric. That's my Eric, signature. Can I resubmit that for a long time? my photo for that one? And then <laughs> we'll just go another 20 minutes or so. <laughs> Yeah, we yes. have to make this longer. Yeah, no, just get rid of that snow thing with the damn trees and then put that one. <laughs> yes. Hmm. All right. Well, thanks a lot for coming, Alex. We enjoyed yeah. chatting with you. Finally, took a while to pin you down. Well. Slippery guy. I wasn't asked all that early, was I? <laughs> Had like eight thoughts. episodes. <laughs> You were in our thoughts early on. <coughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, I'm glad we were able to do it. And it looks like we're close to four hours. So what are you going to do? Edit this thing down? Wow. <laughs> I'll cut out a little bit, but yeah, I don't know. Probably be the longest episode we've done. Two-parter. Because I've been rambling. <laughs> I feel like I talk too much. Uh, I like I need to really shut, up, shut up and let the photos do the talking. It's normally what I do. <laughs> We could do a deluxe edition where we charge people, you know, for the oh, yeah. oh, like a Patreon. Patreon, yeah, for the extra hour or whatever. <laughs> it's just so people greedy, love to pay you know. When podcast hosts do extra content <laughs> <laughs> on Patreon, it's like such a blatant cash grab, you know. <laughs> you have to be a real <laughs> jerk to do something like that. <laughs> yeah, luckily I don't know anybody that does that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, who still has beer left? I was oh, gone I'm, so long ago. Well, yeah, I'm done. Water. Here. I go I through quick. I'm thirsty. End, so. Oh, so it's just warm swill. Just how you like it. Yeah, this is, this is the best part. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My cheeks right. are sore from laughing so much. <laughs> smiling. That's good. It's a good thing. Yeah. I didn't laugh at all. It was boring as shit. Dry. <laughs> Dry as I said yet. <laughs> well, we can redo it next Friday. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe next time he'll get it. Second cut. Uh, this is the pregame. Did you hit the record oh, button this time, you jerk? Jesus oh, Christ, shit, what if you I didn't? Did it, man. <laughs> that would have been terrible. <laughs> All right. Could you, could you imagine? Oh, shit. It would have been terrible that the world would miss out on such an incredible... No, it would have been terrible that I put in all this work for nothing. You know? Yeah, you're Talking really to you, put putting up with you. Jesus. <laughs> Will this be included? Yeah. This banter? Oh, yeah. I haven't ended the episode yet, man. Oh. Cool. You guys are sticking around. You we can viewers. keep it going as long as you want, dude. <laughs> Still here at four hours. Jeez. This is this is green room shit. Let's just try Poor to set James, the record. Like East Coaster. Yeah, we're oh. just keeping you up. It's no, it's, well, it's tomorrow 30. already. Yeah, it's, it's so twelve thirty on Saturday. Yeah, <laughs> we've stayed up this late on weeknights doing Brutal. episodes before. Oh yeah. yeah. It's my fine for me. Uh, my students appreciate it the next day. Yeah. <laughs> they think I'm really like interesting and compelling and still drunk when you show up. <laughs> hey, he's still lit. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like, okay guys, we're gonna play uh um just quiet. <laughs> it's like school of rock, where you just like quiet reading time. <laughs> all right, it's recess all day. Let's go play. Be back later. <laughs> that this is great for me i mean this time because i was up all night last night i was up till 8 a.m processing Damn. because i wow, set that dude. deadline for myself and then i waited till the last minute because i've always been a poor student and a big procrastinator 
Well, the images turn out great. Yeah, had a few tweaks to do, but um, I'm glad I stayed up because now I don't have to think about that. Yeah, got it done. It's so What's rare next? for me to get, I have a top secret project. Working what on. about like uh, trips, just uh, local? Utah, yeah. local, um, like four hours right? away. Yeah. Yeah, I have some winter stuff planned in Utah. Just the usual, you know. Yeah. Badlands and cottonwoods. That <laughs> garbage. And some twigs. <laughs> yeah. A couple leaves if you're lucky. This month. I'll be <laughs> probably go out there for a week. Camp. You know, I camp in the back of the truck and Trucks aren't insulated like cars are, so it's not as nice as it used to be, like in a Subaru. Um, I went out last year, and it was like 10 degrees at night. It was just terrible, so I got a hotel. Because even in a 15-degree sleeping bag, like that is not comfortable. There's no insulation. It's basically like you're outside, um, minus the wind. So this year, I have a big Blue Eddy battery and an electric blanket, so I, oh, do nice. not, I do not want to get a hotel. So you're going to stick just, the electric blanket in your sleeping bag? Uh, yeah, or yeah, underneath the sleeping bag. I use a sleeping bag more like a quilt, but mm. um, yeah, there's plenty of room back there, but that's also part of the problem. It's not cozy like a car. Sarah knows. And your, yours mm -hmm. is nicer than ours. Like yours is more insulated. And you have like more plush accompaniments i guess <laughs> uh you have like the the window coverings with the insulation and like we don't have any of that set up because this truck is temporary so it's just so cold back there and i feel like i'm such an outdoor poser when i like get a hotel it's like i can't even stay in my car like it's not that hard i did winter camping with ridiculous... mike Bellino, you know didn't you have a ridiculous situation too with the hotel like a phone oh, yeah. ringing or something <laughs> Yeah, so Last this year. was in Tory, and that town is dead in the winter. It is very quiet. And everything is closed. Everything is closed, but there was one hotel open, and or at least one, but the one that I picked was affordable. And um, <laughs> there was no one at the front desk when I went in. So I like called the number, and the person showed up in like 15 minutes. But the, it was all open with the lights on. Like the, the lobby was just empty and it's like really tall ceilings. So it's almost like a, the shining vibe or something, you know, like, um, so they show up and check me in. And then the next day, like the phone, I was there by myself for days. Like there was not a single other person staying at this hotel and the phone in the next room started going off one day and it just wouldn't stop. It was ringing off the hook for hours. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like in there processing images, like it was dark out, like there was nothing to do but be in the hotel room and it was just ringing. And I tried going up to the front desk and there's no one there. And I'm just like in this hotel by myself, this ring, this phone ringing out of nowhere. And I can, it was so creepy and so annoying <laughs> and mostly creepy, honestly. Like, why is that phone ringing? Why is it the room next to me out of all the rooms in this hotel? And then like, <laughs> You can see in the window because it's like a motel with an out exterior entrance. I look in and the phone's like blinking in the dark. <laughs> They're trying to bring back Ooh. someone from the Matrix, man. <laughs> exactly. Oh, was, Grab a phone booth. It was Switch trying to get out. <laughs> Tank, Dozer, and Switch. That's right. Neo and Trinity. Anyway, that is going to be avoided with the electric blanket. I'm set. Oh, yeah. So you're like at the typewriter and all work and no play makes Alex a dull boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a MacBook Pro now. Yeah, exactly. It's a modern. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, cheers, guys. Cheers. I got to drive cheers. back home. Got some Phil Monson originals on here. Nice. <laughs> and they match my, my new Nalgene. It's desert themed. But I also have the Oregon Coast in there. Yes. Cheers. Oh, oh, no, stickers in the now, Gene. All right, guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs>